Yes. Yep. All right. I'll see you shortly. Hey, good morning, guys. Can you guys see the presentation on your screen? You can't. Okay. How about now? Okay, we did it. All right, great. Thank you for your help. Hello, Jason. Hello, young lady. How are you? How are you? No, you know. Same, same. <laughs> okay. How are we doing here? All right, we still have some time and hopefully some more people will be jumping on with us. Perfect.
All right, it's getting close to nine, but we're gonna just hold off a few minutes while we wait and see if some other folks are gonna join us. All right, you guys can still see the presentation. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Susan Kenyon, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, here she goes. She's all mic'd up. Look at Britney Spears back in the day. This totally like sets me off when I'm when I sit down and at my desk and I put the headset on. It just flips a switch in my brain like, okay, it's time to get to work, get some stuff done, make some money. I actually like, I think I tell myself without even knowing that I'm telling myself that, like I put the headset on, I'm like, okay, it's a good day to make some money. It's time to Belichick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do your job. <laughs> oh my goodness. If you guys are all here for Ignite, then you're, congratulations, you're in the right place. <laughs> We're going over buyer cons consultations today. Just going to give it another minute for some more folks to jump on. Turn my phone off. I do have my dog home with me today. So there's no guarantees that he's going to be quiet the whole time, but we'll see how he does. How was the seller session yesterday? Was it sellers? It was good? Yeah, it was very good. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So it's 9.02. We're, gonna, we're just going to jump right in and people can catch up to us as they join in. 
Um, well, welcome everybody. My name is Susan Kenyon and I am an agent out of the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Market Center. Um, I, I am a, an, in production. So when I teach any class, I always come from the perspective of production and making money and putting deals together. So that's the flavor of today's session um, or whenever, whenever I'm gonna teach Ignite, that's, that's kind of where I come from. Um, I have been licensed since 2013 and I practice in New Hampshire and Maine. I work with my husband. We are spouses selling houses up here and he's had his license since 2009. Um, and so we do this business together and we, we try to have a lot of fun while we're doing it. So if you guys are looking to get into real estate and make this a full-time gig and it's 100% commission, I'm here to tell you guys you can do it because if we can do it, anybody can do it. And I have today with me, Jason Westcott. Jason is here. Wanna introduce yourself, Jay? I'm gonna um, put my info in the chat room so you guys know who I am. My name is Jason Westcott. I am out of uh, the Portsmouth Market Center as well, Market Center 463. I am the assistant managing broker of all of Keller Williams Coastal Lakes and Mountains. Um, although I sit, my current location where I'm sitting is in Meredith, New Hampshire. We have an office up here that I am the managing broker of up here, but um, I've been licensed since 2003. And I am in my 16th year with Keller Williams. I came here in 2006. Um, that's all I got. All right. That's awesome. I'm putting my information in the chat room, in the chat box. So if you guys ever need anything, you're always welcome to reach out to me. And I can't do that and talk at the same time. So there you go. Um, so we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna today talk about the buyer consultation. Um, so before we get started, you know, please participate. I love that you guys have your, your video on. Please keep your videos on if you're able to. I really appreciate seeing faces instead of just names. Um, and feel free to just unmute yourself, jump right in and interrupt with any questions, comments, experiences that you guys are having as we're going through the presentation today. Um, and remember, you know, how we participate here is how we participate everywhere. So this is uh, the type of job where participation is required. So we get started with that right away in the trainings that we do and what we do in Ignite. So definitely feel free to jump right in. There's no, there's no wrong question. And we're happy to help you guys with anything that you have going on as we move through the buyer presentation today. It usually takes me a minute to just kind of get my self going here with the technology side of life. So, you know, I love this, I love this slide and I like that Ignite starts every session with this slide because, you know, we're so fortunate. Congratulations for picking Keller Williams. You've picked really a, just a phenomenal um, agency to work with because they put so much effort into training us and providing us with the materials that we need to be successful every day. And that's really what Ignite is. Ignite is Keller Williams going out to the most successful agents and saying, what do you do every day to be successful? And that is what Ignite was built around. It was built around the habits that successful agents have to grow a, a big business. And um, that is the, the, what the curriculum has been made of. So if that's what successful agents do every day, then that's what we need to do every day. We don't need to recreate the wheel. And what we like about this slide is that it says every day. So they didn't just do this when they got started. They still do this. Successful agents still do these things every single day. And we, what we are starting with here when we're starting our businesses is we start with the left side of the screen where we're growing our business. Because if we, if we don't do the left side of growing our business, we never even get to the run your business side of things because there's nothing to run. So we start as successful agents with our number one thing, which is lead generation. And that's lead generating for buyers and for sellers. And we make listing presentations. And today we're going to focus on number three, which is make buyer presentations and get buyer. It says get, uh, make buyer presentations and get listings. It really should say uh, get buyer agency agreement signed. Um, so we're going to focus on that today. And we need to preview real estate every day in order to grow our business. Um, the best practices of, of what we're doing here is that this is the best practice for the everyday part of your, of your business. Uh, 
And after you master this and you get those listing agreements signed, you get those buyer agency agreements signed, you get to go over to the right side of the page, which is running your business. And that's marketing to marketing your, your listings that you get signed. And it's showing going shopping with your buyers, you know, showing buyers houses, negotiating contracts. And I think that that's coming up soon, uh, making and receiving offers that and uh, talking about negotiating. That's a session coming up soon, which is a fantastic session. Um, transaction management to close to closing. So contract to close. And I will be back for that session to teach that session. That's one of my favorite sessions because it really is very powerful when you master the contract to close piece for always looking for, you know, getting referrals and repeat business. You do that a lot during, you have the ability to do that during contract to close. And we have vendor management. We, there's a lot of people that come in and out of the transaction. Um, you know, lenders and title companies and appraisers and inspectors. There may be contractors that you're pulling in to help with um, deals that are happening. So we have to be driving the bus and making sure that our vendors are taken care of and that we're providing good resources to our buyers and sellers. And we're setting goals. Who remembers, what is, what is your goal for Ignite? Nobody remembers. We talked about this a lot the first session. Two appointments. Setting appointments is your goal, right? So you should, the goal for Ignite is to set two appointments. So setting goals is part of running your business, whether that's setting goals for something like Ignite, where we have a, a number of contacts that we want to make, right? We want to do 10 contacts a day. We want to write 10 handwritten notes a day. We want to get appointments. Those are our goals. And you'll set more goals as you get to the running your business side of things as far as number of transactions and things of that nature. We're, and you know, running your business is about compliance, making sure that we know what our state's requirements are and risk management so that we're protect, protecting ourselves and we're protecting our, our buyers and our sellers. And we attend training and get coaching just like you're doing here today. And we're managing our money and the financing is one of the, I think it's the second to last Ignite is um, the finance session. Please do not miss it. If you miss it, go back and, and listen to it. Usually Matt Erdman teaches that course and he's phenomenal at teaching money management from a real estate realtor perspective. We work so hard and, you know, sometimes that looks like way more than 40 hours a week, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Right, Jay? You know, we work too hard to not manage our money. If at the end of the year, you're like, man, I had a great year. I closed a lot of deals. I had a lot of commission checks. And you open up your bank statements, or your bank accounts, and there's not money there, then you're not managing your money correctly. So we really need to be aware of managing our money. You know, when we become realtors, we really are starting our own small businesses. So we need to treat our checkbook that way too. So when you get to the, the finance section of Ignite, don't, don't pass over that one. Um, it's a really good one. So that is what successful agents do every day. They do both sides of this screen, but they always start with growing your business. So we've talked a lot in Ignite about lead generation, and there is a reason that is the number one thing to focus on on this slide and on what successful agents do every day. Okay. And we'll keep moving on. So we're going to talk today about, you know, this is our roadmap for today, but it's all about the appointment, right? we got to set the appointment. I was talking to a new agent the other day and I was asking him what his goals were. And he said, I just need to get my first deal. I said, well, how many phone, how many conversations have you had? And he said, two the, in the whole time that he's been having his license and start and getting his um, real estate career going. I said, well, let's put set having a, your first transaction off the table right now, because that really shouldn't be your goal. Your goal is to get the appointment and you can't get the appointment if you don't have conversations about real estate. So you really have to back things up. We all want to be sitting at the closing table, but you can't sit at the closing table if you don't have an agency agreement signed. 
and you don't get an agency agreement, whether it's with a buyer or a seller signed, unless you have an appointment to sit down and talk to somebody about buying, selling, or investing in real estate. And you don't get the opportunity to do that if you don't have conversations with people about real estate, two-way conversations. So we're going to back it up and talk about, you know, you've made the appointment and now you've set the appointment. And what do we do then after we set the appointment? And remember, lead generation goal is about setting the appointment. So that number one thing of lead generating that we're doing, we put you know the headset on, we, we put our mindset in the right place, and our goal when we get on the phone is to set the appointment. How are you guys making out with setting the appointment? Has anyone gotten any content, any appointments? I can't hear you. Oh, I see your hand up there. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think you're muted. Yep. I, I, I am. I was waiting to unmute until you acknowledge oh. me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have a question. Um, sure. Being a, being a new agent, and I don't mind saying that. Um, and this may sound obvious to someone else, but I have I have no prior experience. I have no, not intimate knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Is it appropriate? I went to open houses last weekend. I plan on going to hopefully get to one this afternoon and a few tomorrow. That being said, I, I, I learned some things, very valuable things last weekend. Uh, a couple of them I went to were hosted by KW agents. Another one was another broker. It was wonderful. That being said, I'm gathering um, it's not inappropriate. I, I, I learned something um, through um, Ignite. I didn't realize the person hosting the open house isn't necessarily the listing agent. Um, obviously somebody may be there looking to capture a few buyers along the way. That being said, is it inappropriate for me as a KW agent to go to someone's open house, be it a, a KW or another agency and uh, capture a buyer in there. Very inappropriate. <laughs> That's why. Okay. Very inappropriate. Um, and so thank you, Shelly, for your transparency and just asking the question, because if you don't, if we don't talk about it, how would you ever know? Right? I, I wouldn't. And I have no one to ask. So I yeah. thank you. So open houses, it, they are a lead generation tool. There are people that have built their whole business on doing open houses. It's a fantastic way to, um, to capture unsigned buyers. And sometimes you can get listings out of them as well because the nosy neighbors go to the open house because they want, maybe they're thinking of moving or making a move. So they go to their neighbor's open houses to see what's happening there. But the open house is a lead generation activity for whoever is hosting it. So Previewing real estate, open houses are a fantastic way to preview real estate. But when we do that, we don't talk to buyers there. You really shouldn't, eat, you know, if there's no one there, you can talk to the hosting agent and, you know, just let them know what you're doing. Um, but if there are people there, I don't even talk to, I wouldn't even talk to the hosting agent. They're there to work and get unsigned buyers, not to educate you on the house. Wait till there's nobody there to do that. Um, and, you know, I've had a, a, an agent passing out business cards in the driveway to an open house that I've hosted. And I went right over there and let them know how inappropriate that was because I, I'm working that day. Um, so those unsigned buyers are really there for the hosting agent. But guys, I don't host my own open houses anymore. I don't have time. I put it out on our Market Center Facebook page when I don't have anybody to host one for me. I just put it right out there. Are there any agents out there looking to host open houses? Okay. Um, and I, so I offer that up. Now, another thing that you could do is just put it out there on your own Market Center's Facebook page. You know, I'm a, I'm a new agent looking to gain, gain some experience. I would love to host an open house. If anybody has an open house, they would like hosted. Okay, then you, second you do that. I appreciate that because that was my thought when I went and I did stay out of the way, but I didn't. And I just want to say that I've also very new. Hi, Vanessa. Yeah. I just want to say I'm like literally two and a half weeks. My license has been active, but I'm hosting an open house this Sunday. So 
I just, you know, viewed a couple open houses. I shadowed one. And then my coach was like, why don't you just ask someone who doesn't even have an open house? Like, hey, do you mind if I host an open house? Like, you know, some of the, some of the agents are busy. So she automatically was like, sure, what day, what time? And that's, I mean, I feel like it's a good way for definitely lead generation. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited at the same time. (laughs) Good, good for you. Put yourself out there. Shelly, what else did you have to say? Oh, quick question um, uh, to follow up on that. So when I go to look to check out houses and, 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 you know, obviously I did believe me, stay out of the way. I should not be wearing my Keller Williams badge, just acknowledge myself to the person ho- person hosting the presentation. I mean, I know that makes so much sense, but I just want to make sure that that is the route to go. I wouldn't wear my badge if I were no. going just to preview the real estate. Right. I just out of respect for the co-broke, exactly. I am extremely pa- uh, passionate about okay. co-broke relationships because you're going to be running into those people. Um, okay. And you, we can't be rubbing them the wrong way. Uh, right. We need to be giving them, you know, the, the most respect that we can. So personally, I don't, unless I'm there at an open house with a buyer, then okay. I don't, I don't wear my badge. If I am there with a buyer, then I definitely wear my badge. I want them to know who I am in case I, I might be bringing them an offer. Okay. Terrific. You know? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Are you raising your hand, Mr. Westcott? I am. I, I would also tell you guys that if you're going to do open houses for another agent, because that we, we have this happen a lot at the broker level, like, so in, if I'm going to do an open house for the Kenyan team, I would say to Sue, Hey, can I do your open house at one, two, three main street? She's going to say, yeah, what time? Cause you know, make sure she advertises it. And the next thing you want to ask a list agent is what is your standard? Cause she has promised her buyer or I'm sorry, her seller that I do 10 signs and eight balloons and they go up at Tuesday at three o'clock or whatever it may be. You have to do what, what she did because that's what she's promised her client. Because believe me, guys, that the sellers do drive around and go one, two, three. No, that's only six signs. She said there'd be seven. You know what I mean? And then she's getting blown up. So you, you may ask what the standard is because most agents do have a standard for their open houses. We, we call it the life of an open house. Um, just, just go over that with the list agent. And then the other thing you're going to want to talk about is what happens with the leads. Every agent tend to, don't assume anything in this business, right? Some agents want to pay you to be at their open house. Some agents want you to give, keep all the leads. Listen, you sat there, you keep them. Some of them are going to say anything that they don't buy mine, I want a referral. So just kind of know these are the hard conversations you want to get into with a list agent before doing an open house. Don't assume anything because then you're going to be sitting in front of your broker going, hey, this is what we did. And then we have to go, well, 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 you know what I mean? We have to play that teeter-totter. So just, just very clear. Three questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, my, the way that I do open houses, I don't, you know, some agents will bring like packets of information for everybody. I don't bring, give them anything. Like I don't give them, pass out any information about the house. Personally, I have it there because if I am looking to get unsigned buyers, I need to give them, or I need to have a reason to get back in touch with them. So if I give them the whole, all of the listing and the disclosures and the deed and all of that stuff, there's no reason for me to get back in touch with them. I want an unsigned buyer to want the information. I want to be able to offer them value and I need to have a reason to call them. So that, that's my personal. So when I am sitting down with an agent that's going to be hosting an open house for me, I let them know that I'm like, please don't print a bunch of stuff to hand out that people are going to go over and just throw out, throw out anyway. What you want to do is capture the contact information for unsigned buyers for you for a lead. And you want to contact the agent information for buyers that have an agent for me so that I can reach out to those agents to find out if their buyers are interested in the open house. So I know, have you guys done the session on open houses yet? Okay, so you have a lot of information on that. I don't, I'm, I'm a squirrel, so I'm not going to go too much further down the road of open houses. But um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy uh, off uh, outside of this session to talk to you guys about that. So we're going to talk about setting the appointment today. And, you know, what do we do then? So we're going to talk about the lead generation model. And that is prospecting and marketing. So it's prospecting based and marketing enhanced. And we're going to, I think that was covered in session two, maybe of the, of Ignite. Um, But this is what feeds your database. And we've talked about database. So this is, you know, when we talk about database for most of you, we should be talking about command 
where are we putting the information on the uh, folks that we're contacting so that we can get back in touch with them in a on purpose regular routine oriented way so that they don't so that they always remember who we are and so your database are you know there are people that we capture and they're either going to be a lead or a contact so the leads are basically one way conversations right they're they're a lead they're one way they're um, offer based kind of touch programs we're trying to turn them into somebody that we have two way conversations with uh, where it's more interactive. So a contact really is a two-way conversation. So a lead could be someone that you meet at an open house and you were able to capture their contact information, but you haven't had a two-way conversation with them yet. So we now we have to market to them and offer them value so that we can turn them into a contact where we can actually have a two-way conversation with them about their wants, their needs, how we might be able to help them. If we're talking about buyers, then we want to be able to talk to them about, you know, are what have they been looking, what are they looking for? Are they prepared? And we're gonna we're gonna get more into those conversations um, during today's session. But when a contact shows an intent to buy or sell or invest in real estate, then they drop down into the bottom of this funnel where they drop into cultivate. So we're starting off really big at the top here as we're talking to people about real estate, like at an open house or whatever prospecting and marketing you're doing. And they're gonna drop into the big part of that funnel where we have to turn them into a two-way conversation. Now we're having, we're able, if once we have that two-way conversation and we they're showing intent to wanna to buy or sell, now we put them into um, the cultivate section of this funnel. and you know, the the number is 6.37. 6.37% of your database per year are gonna show intent to buy, sell, or invest in real estate. And if the, if the percentage is 6.37, then we need to have a lot of people in there so that our 6.37% of people that will show intent is a, is a large enough number to sustain our business. So lead generation, when we're, you know, putting on our lead generation hat first thing in the morning, it's to be putting as many people in the top of this funnel as we possibly can so that we can be bringing them down through the cultivate to the cultivate section. If you cultivate well, and by cultivate, that means that we're having interaction, interactive and action-based conversations. They're in a, a, a campaign in your command where they're getting information from you regularly, meaning you're having reminders in your in your program to call them, text them, email them, find them on social media. You're sending them value-based information about the market. You're asking questions. You're nurturing them. You're showing value. And that's what we're doing when we when we cultivate. And when we cultivate really well, we're able to get the appointment. So when we talk about setting the appointment, it's getting people in the top of this funnel, moving them down to cultivate, cultivate really well so that you can get the appointment. Because remember, in cultivate, it's not their job to remember that you're in real estate. It's, it's your job to make sure that they know that you're in real estate. If you do not cultivate well, then what's going to happen is you're going to go on Facebook and you're going to see a post that they just bought a house with somebody else. And you're going to go, hey, how, how did that happen? I've been talking to them for six months. So there's talking to them and communicating with them, and then there's doing it well. So if we're cultivating well, we're getting the appointment and we're getting the transaction. So the cultivate part, you know, people that are showing intent, that's when you need to ask for the appointment. And it doesn't have to be, you know, if they're saying they're going to be ready in a year, set the appointment now. Get in front of them. Build rapport. The more they trust you, the more confidence that they have in you, the more likely they are to pick you 
when it's time for them to go shopping, when it's time for them to like get into action, when it's time for their intent to start having activity behind it. Does that make sense, guys? This whole lead generation prospecting yeah. and marketing funnel? Yeah. I, I have a question. Sure. About the 6.37% of your database. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying that, when you're talking about the number of um, appointments per year because of the 50% attrition rate, so six, that number that you're thinking about, how many appointments do I need? How many listing appointments? How many buyer appointments do I need to meet my goal for the year? That number is 6.37% of your whole database. Well, I would talk, sit down with your productivity coach and figure out what your goals are and they'll backtrack what you are saying you want for, you know, right. a dollar amount that you want to make this year. Yeah, they'll I have back that, that I'm... all the way down. But what they're saying is 6.3%, 6.37% of your database every year will show intent to buy, sell, or invest in real estate. So if you have a hundred people in your database, that's not going to be a lot of business if you have right. versus if you have a thousand people in your database. Right. right. That's and, what I was looking at. I did some quick math. I was like, oh, wow, that's a big number. It's yeah. a big number. Yeah. So when we're talking about our goals for Ignite being the 10 contacts a day and 10 people added to your database, hmm. the reason that it's specific added to your database is because of this. Okay. Because you need to grow that database so that the number of people that will show intent is large enough to feed your family. Right. Because that's the statistic that's tested out. It's so tested out, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, and, and it's nice to have the numbers to back that up because otherwise it's like, it feels like just throwing a dart and yeah. hoping that you, that you hit something. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's never too soon to set the appointment either, guys. Um, when I am, you know, I love working with buyers. They can be a lot of fun. They're, when they start showing intent, and the, it can be like the teeniest little bit of intent, I, I jump on that. Because you don't know, if they're showing intent, you never know what is going to happen in their life to make that intent stronger, to make their motivation and their need stronger. So when I'm working, you know, I, I kind of grade my buyers like an A buyer, a B buyer, a C buyer. An A buyer is somebody that is qualified with the lender. They have a, a need and they, and they are prepared to write an offer. A C buyer might be someone that's just starting to show intent. So I need to spend more time with my A buyer, but I can't forget about my C buyer because someday they're going to, I need to move them along until they're an A buyer. I need to help them and show them value until they're an A. But sometimes a C buyer will be hanging out there for quite a while and something happens in their life. And if you're cultivating that well, and you've already had appointments with them, that you're building rapport, when that motivation changes, they're going to call you. And they can go from a C to A with one phone call. So you have to be ready for that. And you get ready for that by having setting the appointment, setting that first appointment with them to start building that rapport. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions on that? Can I uh, ask a question? I, uh, sure. I understand that the prospecting is one a huge part of our business uh, of uh, uh, lead generating. So uh, I've been calling about 10 people a day uh, about the real estate, okay? Uh, not, they're, they're not random people. They, they, they people from my, uh, you know, uh, my phone, my contacts, my uh, Facebook uh, uh, friends. So I, I know a little bit. And uh, if, even though I, uh, I spoke with 10 people a day, so after a week, it's like 70 of them, none of them were interested in, uh, in buying or selling. So it's like, I don't have any appointments. They're they not interested in uh, you know, sending appointments with me because they're not 
interested in buying or selling, at least now. So how is yeah. that uh, thing, setting appointments? I know it's a very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, very important thing to do, setting appointments, but, but after speaking with 70 people, I didn't make any because they weren't interested. So yeah, so there's, if they if they they're not, not... I'm, I'm sorry, if they're not on the market, I'm not going to push them to sell their house if they just bought it the, two years ago or something like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, good for you for making the contacts and don't stop. So what that is telling you is that they're not in the cultivate section of this funnel yet. They don't right. have intent. So you just have to keep adding more people into the top. And yes, Michael Mahoney has a, a great um, script right here. Who do you know that I need to know? So sometimes it might not be that contact. It's asking them who they know that might be ready to buy or sell. And, yeah, and yeah, a lot of the times it's going to be a no. They might not know anybody. But you stay in relationship with them with these contacts and it's hard now because you're just starting and most people aren't going to be ready yet. So the whole purpose of staying in touch with them, that you know, like you might've heard like a 36 touch 36 times a year, you're staying in touch with them throughout the course of a year or it might, you might be staying in touch with them for two years, three years before they're ready to buy. But the more you stay in touch with them, the more value you add, the more you're reminding them in the best possible way that you're in real estate, that will come back to you with a referral. It will come back to you with them being ready and showing intent and setting the appointment at that time. So it can be very frustrating. I, I hear you on that, Andy, that you're calling and people aren't ready. Don't give up. You just keep calling. It means you're not calling enough people because there are people out there that are, that are buying and selling today. We just have to find them. And it's a, it's a lot of work. It is, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I never sugarcoat that when I sit down and talk to agents that are people that are looking to get into this business. It's not, I got my real estate license and I'm putting it out there on Facebook and all of a sudden I'm going to have all this business. It does not work that way. It's constantly adding value, giving people information that brings value to their life, showing that you are a professional, demonstrating that you have expert knowledge. It's that's why part of that, you know, that running your business is the coaching and training. It's coaching and training. It's training so that I'm learning constantly how I can bring value to people. So when they have a need, they're like, Susan Kenyon, that's your person. Call her. So just keep at it and you'll get the appointment. Yeah, so uh, that number one on this on this slide, prospecting and marketing, once you, uh, uh, you know, get that uh, lead, put them in, uh, in the number two leads and uh, number three contacts. So on top of that prospecting and marketing, there's supposed to be prospecting, marketing and uh, patient. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yes, absolutely, and the, Andy. And the patient. <laughs> You do. And it's hard. You know, the, the person that talks to you the most is yourself. So we have to be, you know, I, I have sticky notes on my screen at work. I'm at my home office now so that I'm not bothering the rest of my office with teaching Ignite. Um, but I have reminders on my, on my desk that I look at. I have affirmations. So because I talk to myself more than anybody else does. So I need to tell myself, I add value to people's lives. I, I, I am here to support and serve. I come from gratitude. I'm thankful and blessed for the things that I have. And I'm looking today to find someone that I can help. And I'm going to find them. And they're going to be happy to talk to me. I tell myself these things so that it makes getting, getting on the phone and making that call a little bit easier for me. So when you're hearing no, 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 Take a break, tell yourself something positive, feed your brain and your motivation and get back on the phone. Or maybe you need to get off the phone and go downtown wherever you live and get involved in something where you can interact with people. Remember your Ford script, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Yeah. 
find your people and talk to them about those things that will come back to you in real estate. Keep at it. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I don't think I see any hands up. So I am uh, not the best at looking at the digital hand, but if you guys have anything, you can do that too. And I, I will eventually see you. Um, so role model, set the, setting the appointment. Um, so we're not gonna, I'm not gonna force you guys into doing actual scripting with me right now, um, but you should have, a, you have a script book and there is a section in the script book um, on buyer consultations and setting the appointment. And I would really encourage you guys to look at that, read through it, find a script partner. If you don't have one, they are invaluable. We need to practice with each other so that we're not practicing on our contacts. I, I, will, I will add real quick that out of the 870 agents that are at Keller Williams Coastal Lakes and Mountains, John Kenyon and his wife scripted the most and practiced the most out of anybody. <laughs> we all heard them. We all heard them in conference rooms. We all heard them do it. So she's not kidding. That is the scripts do work, guys. Like, you know, it, it's one of the hardest things that agents will say to the a newer agent will say to a seasoned agent, man, you guys are so good on the phone. It's all that we all just get the same book you guys have. And we just learn them and, you know, um, you, you memorize them, personalize them and then use them. You know what I mean? Just get, get a feel for them. That may, may not be your, your style. It may not be a word that you like to use and then just change, change it up a little bit, you know, personalize them a little bit, but the, the message is the same. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I'm, I only did it because my husband did it. I mean, he got his license before me and he just jumped. You know why he did it? Because I don't even think they had Ignite back then, did they, Jay? 2009? Maybe they did. Somebody so it, was called, it, was, it was called 443 then. 443. He asked people, he, he went to the successful agents in the Portsmouth KW office and said, what do I need to do? And they said, you need to script. He did whatever they told him to do. He, put, he parked his ego at the door. He had me and three small children at home that were counting on him to get a commission check. And he would have to come home and I would ask him, did you set an appointment today? And if he didn't, do you, how do you think he felt? You know, you need that accountability. So when they said find a script, pa 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 uh, script partner, he did. And it helped him grow his business. Um, you know, and the importance of scripting and making your calls is because you're listening for clues when you're talking to someone. You can't effectively listen if you're so worried about what you're going to say next. So we script so that we don't have to think about what we're going to say when we talk to people because we've internalized conversations. We've practiced objection handling. And that frees up our mind when we're on the phone with people to listen. Um, we, can, we can listen for clues on, on needs, on you know things like, are they looking to downsize? If you're so worried about what you're going to say next and they use the word downsize and you didn't pick up on that because you were so worried about what you were going to say, you're missing an opportunity for a meaningful conversation on, great, you're thinking of downsizing. Tell me more about that. What will your life look like? Why are you doing that? Or maybe they're upsizing and maybe they're not using those words, but maybe they're telling you that all their kids have, um, you know, graduated from school and moved out of the house. That's, they're telling you that they're ready to downsize when they say that. So we need to be listening when we're talking to people for clues. Um, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're talking about wanting to, they have money that they want to invest and they're looking for opportunities for that. Great. Have you ever thought about real investing in real estate? What would that look like? Open up, open up the conversation, get their mind thinking about something else. Um, and if they say something that to you is sounding like a possibility of intent, great. Let's set up a time when I can come out and, and meet with you and talk to you in more in depth about that. Set the appointment. That's a good time to set that appointment. Um, when lead generating, your goal is making the contact, setting the appointment. And when we're going to move into next is when we do get that appointment, what our goal is going to be, it's going to be about getting an agency agreement signed. And the appointment is about relationship building. So let's talk more about that. We're going to talk about um, preparing the buyer presentation. 
So we need to go into those those appointments and those um, those sessions with our potential buyers with intent and with a goal. So there there'll be three objectives at the buyer appointment. Um, one, the first number one goal is always to get the agreement signed. Okay. We need to get it signed because if I'm going in after you, I'm going to get it signed. And there's an, and I'm everywhere. There's other agents, other Susan Kenyons out there that are gonna be looking to get that agreement signed. So that has to be your goal, your number one goal when you're at, at that buyer presentation. And you need to be to bring value. So what is your value proposition? Have you guys had the value proposition session yet? You know, work on that. It, it's really important that elevator pitch that you have or, or how are you bringing value is gonna be really important when you have that buyer presentation, okay? Because you need to be the expert. You need to show them and demonstrate your skills. And then you need to learn, you know, what does your buyer want? What do they need? There's going to be a whole set of, you know, questions that we're going to ask them to really dig down into what their, what their wants and needs are. So when you're preparing and doing the buyer presentation, you can start in with in command for making your buyer presentation and go to the designs tab. I forget which one it is, but that vertical line on the left, maybe the third one down, is designs. There are at least two, maybe more now, buyer presentations in there. So we're going to talk about, you know, what you can do to those buyer presentations, what type of information, how to how to customize that to be more personalized towards you and what you're bringing to the table. So we need to bring value. We need to determine their wants and needs. We need to find out what their motivation is because we need to use that motivation as we get them through the buying process. We're gonna demonstrate our expertise and we're gonna qualify them to make sure that they really are a buyer, okay? So let's talk about creating the presentation. Have you guys had a chance to go in and look at any of those buyer presentations? I started doing, but it's very difficult. Yeah, I'm with you, Anita, it is. Um, well, I, you have tech trainers. So is it the technology part that's, that's, cha that's challenging for the buyer yeah, presentation? Uh, my MCA taught me, but when you start doing it, it doesn't behave like you want. <laughs> Keep and there are too many pages that 30, 40, people don't read so much. So I want to make it less. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for simplifying it too. Um, sometimes they can be very long. Um, I have one question for that. Yeah. They gave glossary of all the words and the initial uh, uh, boosting talk, oh, you made right decision, or that whole theory. Nobody reads all that. Is it okay if we remove all those? You can, you can do whatever you want to personalize that. Um, and okay. sometimes your buyer presentation may be some of that, just that you're going to leave that for them to go through some of that when you're not there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to read your audience. Some people are going to want to go through a lot. Okay. And some, some of your buyers are going to be like, you're going to see them kind of glaze over. Okay. That, that's your signal to move on that they don't want to see all that stuff. And that's okay. okay. Because by you being prepared and having a presentation, even if you don't get the chance to go through it all, you're showing them that you're a professional. Oh, okay. okay. You're so showing the them that you're not winging it. Okay. So the glossary and all will be helpful for them. So just leave it. Just leave it. Okay. I don't go through, I don't go over a glossary with my folks when I'm sitting down with them. Okay. Um, so definitely just leave it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. But you do want to personalize your presentation. You know, when you go in there, you can modify the, if you're using the one in designs, yes. you know, you want your contact information in there. We don't yes. want to be secret agents. No, no. It, we always have to be making sure that it's very easy for people to find our phone number and our email. You know, even on the MLS, I, I find mm -hmm. some agents don't put their cell phone numbers down in when they're putting, have their profile on the, on the MLS. I'm like, why are you doing that? Every, that should be the easiest thing for a person to find should be your cell phone number. Okay. So, and you know, personalize it with having your logo on there. If you have a logo, 
having your picture so people see what can see what you look like. You know, um, you. read through the presentation to see what you like or you don't like and take out what you don't, Anita. If you don't like it, you can change it. Um, you can put your market center information in there. And so I'm going to speak broadly because we all have different compliance rules, whereas a lot of different states happening here. Um, and make sure that your presentation, if you have marketing material, there is compliance around what you have to have in terms of information about your brokerage. Make sure that you have the right stuff there. So talk to whoever in your market center is in charge of compliance and make sure that that's in there. Um, you can talk to your productivity coach and your tech trainer as well if you're having issues with, with your designs. And it's okay if you have to go back a couple of times to talk to them about that. This, it's, it's a lot to, to learn all at once. Um, you can also go to answers.kw.com. There's tools there. Um, it's good if you don't know what to do or where to go. You can go also to the KW Tech Enabled Agent section. Those are places that you can go and somebody at your market center should be able to direct you on how to get to all of those places. Um, in command, if you don't know how to get even get started, just click on the question mark and, and that will help you. There's a lot of resources on there. And the, um, the YouTube, the, the KW Command YouTube station, um, I forget what, uh, Jason, do you remember what um, Robert's YouTube page is? Because he has a lot of helpful videos in there on command too. It's kwtechtube.com. Thank you. I knew you would remember it. So there's resources there too. But we need to start with creating our presentation. And let's get more into that. So the buyer presentation is, you know, the table of contents. You can have a section on your dream home, your preferences your neighborhood, buying 101, like what's the, uh, the buying 101 for me would be the, the most favorite section where you have a roadmap to show them what the process is going to look like. So we're not gonna build an actual presentation here today. We're gonna give you guys information so that you can go back to designs or go back to whatever program that you're using if you're doing it in Canva or whatever to start building your own presentation. But these are some things that you can put in there as you're, as you're building a, a, a buyer presentation. And you might rename them. These are just a, kind of a roadmap to get you started. You know, at your service, there's a section on my promise. That is in one of the designs um, presentations. You can, you can read that. And some people do put a glossary of terms because, you know, there's a lot of language that happens in real estate that our folks are not used to. Our customers are not used to the language that we use. And sometimes we forget that. So we, we don't want to be doing things like using acronyms. There's a thousand acronyms, KW, um, you know, F, you know, FISBO. They don't know what a FISBO is, a for sale by owner. So we need to sometimes give them information on, you know, what the market is, what is the language that they're going to start hearing as we go out shopping. So you might choose to have a section on or a component here on, um, on glossary. So we'll break it down by section. So your dream home, this is really a great place to start. When I am sitting down with a buyer, I start with, just, you know, I, I start with trying to get them to be relaxed because the more relaxed they are, we can start building rapport more quickly. And what we need to do is we need to, op we need to have them open up to us. And sometimes they're coming in, they're nervous. They don't know what to expect from this meeting. So we need to start off with getting them to relax and start talking about their dream home. They might not know what their dream home is or what they think in their head their dream home is. Might be something different after you guys have this meeting with them. And it may change during the, the shopping period as well. But this page can just lighten the mood and loosen up the buyer. And then they'll be able to start giving you more valuable information. Okay. So visualize your, you know, and you can read some of these things right off to them. Visualize your dream scenario for buying your home. 
we want them to visualize. So tell me, what is what is your dream home? What are you looking for? You know, why why are you looking? What type of know your audience? What type of buyer is this? Is it a first time home buyer? Maybe their dream home is way out of their reach. So we need to start them off in a first time home until they can get to the big picture dream home and walk them down that path. Is it a move up buyer? Maybe it's a move up buyer that is, they've been thinking about their dream home for a long time. And now they're ready to, to get out of their first time home and move up to a dream home. Maybe it's Maybe they're retiring and that's gonna look a lot different too, right? Maybe they're downsizing. So when they're talking about, you know, visualizing what they're looking for, it's going it, to look different for different people. You know, here's a great question. What's the one thing that has to happen to make that dream scenario a reality? And let you can pause when you're talking to them so that they have a chance to think about that. They might not have thought about some of the, some of these questions before. You know what question I love? Why is that important to you? What are we learning when we ask that question? Motivation. Motivation. We need to know their motivation, guys. If their motivation is so that they can be closer to their grandchildren and you start taking them out shopping and you're on like their the 25th home and they haven't put an offer in yet, you need to go back to their motivation and figure out why you're you know why are you showing them so many houses that they're not putting offers on? And ask them, you know, what would your life look like if we put an offer on this house today and you were able to be able to see and live next to your grandchildren for Christmas? So we need to know their motivation. And then we can say, how can we make that happen for you? And then tell them how you're going to make that happen for them. And you and and ask them directly if we could if we if I could make one more thing happen to this process to make it better. What would it be? We don't know. We have to ask them. So those are great questions that you could ask, you know, and, and the why is that important to you? you? You might ask that more than one time. You know, why is, you know, if they're looking for something, a, a farmhouse or something with a lot of land, why is that important to you? Or if you get the other, I mean, the other why if you have a, for instance, husband and wife, and the husband says, I want a five car garage with a one bedroom apartment above it. And the wife's saying, I want a two car garage and a four bedroom colonial. <laughs> you got to start finding why is that important to you? Why is that important to you? Because, you know, you will, that will come into play. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They may not you be know, on the same page. <laughs> they might not be on the same page. And yeah. sometimes this job is being part therapist. <laughs> Pulling. It, it's seriously like you got to pull the couple together. You got to pull you, the deal together. <laughs> you're, you're a therapist a lot of the time. So if there's more than one buyer, you need to know who's making the decisions here. Because a lot of the times it's the wife, if you have a husband, wife, or if it's, if it's partners of, of any kind, one of those partners usually has more influence on the decision than the other. So you need to figure out who that, which one that is. But you want to make sure that you're on the same page. And, you know, you, they might start off saying, and this has happened to me, I had a young couple that did not want a box colonial, they wanted an old house, pref preferably a farmhouse that that had, you know, the old creaky wooden floors, we showed them a lot of properties, they ended up buying a brand new box colonial. So sometimes things shift and change as you're showing them the market. Um, so you guys can customize this, this page too, when you get to this part of making your presentation. Um, but you know, the why is this important to you is a great one. If this is the first meeting, this just opens the, the door for you. So this is a great place to start to get your folks, you know, more relaxed and more open to having conversation with you. Can I, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, sure. Can you, can you please uh, go back a couple of pages and, and show me from the start, from, from the design, how to get to that page. I, I have no idea. I, when I yeah, go to yeah. designs, I go and I find the templates and all that stuff, but I, I, I don't see the buyer's presentation, you know, kind of. Susan, uh, go back one more. 
if you can. Sorry. Yeah, one more. One more. No, no, but back. So if you're oh, if you're here? here and you're gonna click on the design tab, which is kind of what's lit up already, that's opportunity to handshake. And what the, the baby blue and that's like the house. Nope, see the yeah, baby my... blue go down. You click on that and then you're gonna get this created design. It's gonna ask you to temple temple type. You're gonna put for a buyer agency, you're gonna pick put in buyer, and it's gonna ask you, do you want to email, social, or print? So you're gonna to want to do print, and then it should bring you into the 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 six or seven designs. And when you click on it, the one that she had is the, the black version, it's called. There's a black, a black and white, and then what they call a traditional. So the black one is the one that is on that tablet that she had. And then the white one is opposite, which I don't like it because it has like KW in it, but it's really hard to see. It's very confusing to me, but I'm, I'm an engineer. So I have, I have that. It's got to be equal or it's out. So I do the traditional styled one. And then through that, it, it works just like um, Canva or like a really, really, really cheaper version of... Um, publisher where you can like remove something out of it like if you don't like a box you click on it and cut and then you can upload a picture oh, cut, of yeah, your yeah. your house and all that yeah so it, it, they're right there like and then you'll get the template that she has behind this you see that's what you'll get the different templates that you want okay so so it, it, it should just be design start here pick, yep you design that yeah and then this pops up this box that you guys see right. type you're gonna put buyer because this fisbo buyer seller all these different ones. And then you're going to want to pick, do you want an email? Do you want a social or do you want to print? So, you know, if social would be like a Facebook page, right? email would be if you want to email it. Now I, I suggest going back to what Susan was talking about earlier. Like if I'm going to meet with the Kenyans, I'm going to say, Hey Susan, I'm going to, I'm going to email you this. And this goes back to what Anita was saying. I'm going to email you this, please review it for when I get there. And then they're going to say, I already read that. I don't, I don't care about this section. I want to know more about that section. It does speed up your process a little bit, especially on the buyer side, because <laughs> buyers just want to sign and go look right. But there's a lot yeah, of yeah. stuff you guys need to go over, especially with the DOJ coming into play and all this stuff about commissions and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there are sections that you really want to hit on with them and you guys should go through your presentation and realize what you really need to hit on. And I agree with Susan, like, what do you guys want to buy? Why is that important to you? Like, before we go shopping, like, give me what you want to go look at, because yet you may hear that there's only seven houses on the, on the market. There's actually 400 in the, in the county that you live in that you may want to look in. And we got to narrow it down to the, the style that you want. Um, but yeah, it's right in this, it's right in this design template. And here's the thing, what I would do is I would go in and go into an opportunity, make, make, I would have people in this room meet up. You guys are all newer agents. I would suggest, or I would assume just say, Hey, Susan, can I, is it okay if I send you something and then build one and send it to Susan? She'd be like, yeah, man, but you spelt your name wrong or yeah, but this is backwards or yeah, but you didn't put our market center logo on the bottom. It just says Keller Williams international work with each other, right? You guys can learn from each other. And that's a great way to do it. We always tell people to try to team up. And, you know, in Ignite rooms and bold rooms or, or whatever, whatever room you're in to be able to send them something and counterbalance back. Like, like uh, somebody put up in there, they're looking for a script partner. I think it was Mitch, um, you know, great script partner. And then, Hey, Mitch, while we're doing scripting, do you mind if I send you one of these templates? You tell me if it's, if it, if it's bad, like I miss something, you guys can all learn together. Right. And it's, it's yep. the best way to do it. Um, we, we have script club too at here at our market center, like you guys could probably do that in your market centers. Who wants to do scripting? You're not the only new agent, right? Like just remember that in your market center, there's probably a handful that would like to do it. And uh, you know, there, there are rules to scripting. So meet with your productivity coach or your, or your TLs and they'll give you the, you know, three yeses, three no's to a yes. Right, Susan. Um, <laughs> and, and there's ways to do it, but, but work with each other, get good at using this stuff because you don't ever want to have a client go, okay, I'm ready. And then go, how do I do this? Cause guess when it is Friday at nine 30. Yeah. Right. And as a managing broker, guess when I don't like to answer my phone Friday at nine 30. <laughs> yeah, I do, but I don't like it. Um, yeah. So yeah, be, be prepared, right. Ready to take the lead. That's all yep. I got. You have to, that's all you got. That was good. Thank you, Jason. Does that, are you good with that? Does Thank that help you, Andy? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate you're, it. You're very welcome. Rita? Oh, hi. Um, the question that I was wondering is you, you say you ask the client, what do you, what do you want? Well, isn't the question that you should be asking them is or the want? 
You know, really both of them, they're going to be looking to you for guidance. So building the presentation is going to show them that you're a professional mm -hmm. and the language that you use is, is going to be personalized to your, your style. So when I'm sitting down, I definitely like to do buyer presentations in person when possible. Um, they're really more challenging when they're not in person. It's easier to build rapport when they're in person. And I just start with, tell me what you're looking for. Why, you know, why are we here today? Basically, you're, you you want to know what they're looking for. And then you're going to want to throw suggestions out there. They're, you're going to say a lot to them. Well, tell me more about that. I'm looking to move to Dover, New Hampshire. Great. Why? Tell me more about that. What's happening in Dover? Who's moving? Who are you going to be with? Is it just yourself? You know, then they might be, you know, there's a lot of people moving with parents right now. Um, it might be for kids in school. It might be because of a job. You know, it, tell me what you're looking for. Yeah. Do they have pets? Do they, you know, you're learning. This isn't uh, really to be a real formal process. This is to open the door. The dream page is to lighten the mood so that they can just start talking to you authentically about their life. So when you come from curiosity on their life and caring about that, those con those pieces of information will come out about their wants and needs. Yeah, and 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 you know, always dig deeper. We always teach you guys that in any class you're going to hear from Killer Wins, it's always ask great questions, dig deeper, you know, go go three, go to a no, you'll hear all these terms. Because you know, if I'm sitting down with Susan, I'm a brand new buyer, maybe new to the area. Now I don't know where everybody's from, but I I live in the seacoast, even though I sell up on the I'm I don't sell anymore, but I'm up in the Lakes region. But if I said to Susan Canyon, hey Susan, listen, really love Dover. Viewed the town, want to live here. I want to spend 300 I want a four bedroom colonial, and I want a three car garage. Now she has to have a different conversation with me because there's no yeah. such thing, <laughs> right? Or, or she, I may say to her, I'd like to live, I'd like to live downtown, you know, but I want, I want a three bedroom condo. Again, there's it, that, there's maybe three Susan, right? I mean, yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it, again, that's a whole. Now you're having, you're funneling what conversations and what pathway you need to show them, you know. Or the other thing is, hey, listen, I'm a, I'm a veteran, I'm a uh, former Marine, and I say this because Susan Kenyon's family is very mm -hmm. military. I'd like to buy new construction. I, don't, I have no money to put down. I want to use my VA benefits. That's a whole nother conversation now because that's not going to happen yeah. here. So, you know, the needs versus wants comes down to where are we going? Why are we here? What do you, what do you, you know, what do you, what do you need? What do you want? Whatever. And I agree with, with what you guys, what both are saying, it depends on who that person is. Right now, if I come in and say, Hey, I just won the lottery. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You can pretty much have what you want. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if, if, if I, you know, if I said, Hey, I just fixed my credit. My loan officer told me I'm, I'm available now. All right. What is it you need? You know what I mean? Cause I'm just now she may know that this is a gateway. I'm just trying to get my credit back going. I just want to buy a condo. I'm a younger guy out of college. Maybe this is my first, my first stepping stone. So need versus want, I agree with Susan totally comes down to the, the client, but ask the questions of what they want, because you know, the top five, we, we teach the top five, what are the top five things you want? If we get four of those, are you okay with that? Right. Cause it's, it's all going to come down to a price point. Right. So if I want a dining room, right. Cause I, I, I'm a dining room guy, dining room, big kitchen, in ground pool, lot of land and this, well, if I get you everything, but you know, maybe that you, is that something you'd want to look at. Right. And that, that stops a lot of like, Hey, this house just, cause we're going to put them all. I don't know if you guys have collab centers. We have a thing called the collab center where you put a buyer into the MLS and it, it sends them the, the, the MLS sheet, um, you know, the new listing. Why didn't you tell me about this house? Well, it's not a colonial. It doesn't have a pool doesn't have a garage. Like these are the things you told me you wanted, right? So you got to protect yourself too, because buyers tend to want to, even when they find the greatest home, they want to see the next one. I love this home, but we'll, let's see what comes on this weekend. Well, that one's yeah. going to be gone, right? Yeah. Especially in the market we're in. So that's why we're kind of asking these questions. It's always bringing them back to a motivated spot, right? And, and going back to what Susan was saying, my mom, when she bought her house, my parents, when I was a senior in high school, my mother said, I will never buy a raised ranch. Guess what they bought? Uh, right. Yeah. My mother walked into it and said, this is the house. My father went, really? You know what I mean? But yeah. it, it was a huge raise. It was just not what she pictured as a raised ranch being. I mean, it was a 6,000 square foot raised ranch. So my mother was like, no, this isn't, this is not a raised ranch. My dad's like, yeah, yep. It's just big, but yeah, this is one. So yeah. always come from, from ask the questions. I'm from need, curiosity. Want. Yep. Come from curiosity. And, and, you know, part of that's going to come out when we're, we're talking about building your your, pre your preference profile, okay? And this is the information that we put into their contact and command. We write notes in command about them so that we remember them, but we need to build a preference profile for our buyers so that we know what their wants and needs are. And what that does is it, it uncovers expectations and preferences. Setting, the, setting expectations 
is super important when you're working with buyers. You know, we can get caught up in our day. They're looking at the market. If they're a hot buyer, they're looking at it all day long. They're on Zillow. They're on Realtor.com. They're on whatever information you're sending them. They're on Facebook all the time. They're asking, talking about it to their friends. They're going to, you need to set expectations on a lot of things. And one of them is going to be communication. So you have to set the expectation. How are we going to communicate? So you need to find out how they like to communicate. You know, how do they want to be communicated to and how often? And what kind of information? Is it details? Or is it just like, you know, just tell me what I have to know and I don't want a lot of information about it. So if somebody is working, if if I was a buyer and they had to come work with me and my husband, I would A, have to probably pay them a lot of money because I want a lot of information and my husband wants to know like just two things. That's it. So he, I have, they have to satisfy two very different people sometimes. So we need to set the expectations. Are we texting? Are we calling? Are we emailing? And what times of day are you willing to respond to that? Right now, if you don't have a lot of clients, you might be jumping into, I am available 24 seven. Don't set that expectation. Because as soon as the, if they have the expectation that you're 24 seven and you're out with your friends and it's 10 o'clock at night and that night you don't get back to them, they're disappointed. So I let, so we talk about that when we're sitting down and talking to our buyers. Okay, if it's, if it's quick information, then let's just do text. But if it's a lot of information, then we need to get on the phone. I don't like to have lots of converse, uh, information back and forth through text because things get lost. And are we storing these details in command? Absolutely. So we're creating a contact and then we're putting notes in. So when, you're, when you guys are sitting down and making your calls or after your buyer presentation, you go back to command and you put that information in there because you think you're going to remember, but you forget. Okay, who are the decision makers? It's usually one of, if there's multiple people, it's usually one person that spearheads the decision making. Um, if there's a lot of details for the expectation side, follow it up with an email so that you have, you know, making sure that we had a conversation, there's a lot of details. Now I'm gonna email them that to make sure that I'm hearing things the way that they're hearing them. Some people go so far as to set expectations that if you text me, I will get back to you within an hour. If you call me, I'll get back to you by the end of the day. If you email me, it will be probably the next day. So if you're very rarely able to respond to emails quickly, you need to set that expectation that if you need something you know, immediately, shoot me a text and I'll get right back to you. If it's a phone call, it's most likely going to be by the end of the day. And know your person. If you're working with an older person, I have a, a lady that I'm working with now that's that's like probably 65. She, she, she texts, but she's not gonna email. So I, I better not be sending her anything by email. And she's not signing anything electronically. So you got to kind of set those expectations, put a note in to command. When we're starting their profile, we are, you know, we're starting, we're also doing a timeline. So you have somebody that want that you're sitting down with for a buyer presentation, make sure that they're pre-approved and have a, a very direct conversation about their pre-approval and talking to a, a lender. Oh yeah, I because you're gonna have buyers that go, oh yeah, I'll just talk, you know, when we find something, I'll reach out to them. Mm -mm. Don't take someone by shopping if they haven't talked to a lender yet. You're just wasting your time and their time. But you have to find a nice way to say that, right? So you say something like, you know what, we're gonna have you talk to our preferred lender, or maybe you give them a couple of local lender names. We really need to know what what you're where you're at and what kind of um, lending you have because I don't want to show you the perfect home only for you not to be able to purchase it or put an offer in. I don't want to disappoint. You don't want them to be disappointed. So you need to know what their purchasing power is. Uh, we also like want to show them how to be a strong buyer. So be the professional. We're going to build a prep pro, a profile on them so that when you do identify the right house, you're, you're going to be able to help them be a very strong buyer because right now the market is so competitive. And if it's an A buyer, uh, you know, you have buyer agency signed, they're pre-approved, 
and they can write an offer today. That's an A buyer. If you have somebody with those three things, they move to the top of the line. Okay. So we're going to do things like, um, you know, the what, the when, the how. Let's talk about the best way to get in touch. That's the communication and setting up the, the expectations. What's your favorite way to receive information? That's the email, call, or text. And you, if you could have a sheet like this at your buyer presentation, and you might just be circling them so that you have, a, have documentation to go back with. And you're showing them that you're professional. What's the best way to reach you? Like, when is the best time to reach you? Morning, noon, afternoon, evening, anytime. Some people can't, you know, we have the, the shipyard is right near where we are, Jason and I are. If that person works at the shipyard, they can't have their personal cell phone on them while they're at work. I need to know that because if I'm trying to text them something, if I have something very urgent and I'm texting them and they're not getting back to me, it, they can't get back to me. So I need to know, I need to know when I can get a hold of them if something comes up. If we're like putting an offer in and I know that they work at the shipyard and I can't talk to them during the day, I might be staying up later at night to talk to them when normally I wouldn't do that. But for this buyer, I might need to do that. As updates arise, how often do you prefer to be notified? You know, if you're working with a buyer and their motivation is like not super strong, they might, and they're not getting back to you, you need to know, you need to have, ask more questions about that. You know, if they want to be notified about properties right away uh, in a few hours that day, you need to know what their expectation is because if you're thinking, that that's fine, I can, this, this isn't that urgent, I can get back to them tomorrow. They might be thinking it's very urgent and you're not getting back to them and they're sitting on their end being disappointed. And that's not a good relationship to be going into, okay? If there's more than, you know, multiple people in the buying situation, um, who, who's my main contact? Do you, I need to contact both of you when the property comes up that you want to see? Or, or is there just one of you that I should be reaching out to? What's their timeline? This is the, some of the, the needs part, Rita, you know, their, their timeline. Why do they need to move? Do they have to be somewhere by the time school starts? Do they have to be somewhere by winter? What's their timeline? And the, you know, obviously the price range is going to go along with what their buying power is, but their buying power might be 900,000, but where's their comfort level? Their comfort level might be 500,000. They might, their, their, their loan, their shop buying power might be 300,000, but their wants section might be 800,000. Now you have a big gap that you have to bring them down to reality on. So being very direct here is super important when we're building their profile so that you're both on the same page. And if, if you don't like asking direct questions, then you're not in the right job. This is the time where they need us to be asking them very direct questions. And sometimes that's around money. The reason that we talk about their dream home first is because we're getting them to relax. We're building rapport. We want to see them physically re relax before we get to some of these questions, because these are very direct questions. We're going to now start talking to them about money. That makes some people pucker. But we have to know, you know, we need to know where about their wallet. So they have to have confidence in us before we have the, the right to ask those questions. And then we're going to ask them, if, if I found a home today that checked all of your boxes, could you see yourself making a move sooner rather than later? Another way to ask that is, if I found you the perfect home today, would that be too soon? That's kind of how I would, at, at that section, if I found a home today that checked all of your boxes, find the way that that flows out of your mouth the best, because that's a very important question. If I found the right home for you today, would that be too soon? If they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, that's too soon. Great, you need to know that. So now let's go back a little bit and talk about their timeline, okay? This is the, the time where you're starting to take control over the buying process and showing them that you're the one driving the bus. 
and that they can trust you to do that and take good care of them. And then of course, you know, you need all the nitty gritty information, name, phone, address, email, so that you have all of their information. And we, we want their home, we know they're buying, but we need to know where they live today. So we get all of that information. So this is really the what, the when, the how, the how piece of collecting information. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions on this? No? Okay. The lending part, when we talk about pre-approval, that's really gonna be one of the biggest pieces, um, especially in the market that we're in right now. Well, for a lot of reasons. A, we don't wanna waste anyone's time. And we don't wanna, we don't wanna disappoint them. If they, if they need to work on their credit, then we wanna help them. We wanna get them to a lender that can help them do that so that we can get them on track with getting the right home for them. I try not to use the word perfect home because when Jason was saying, you know, find out what their requirements for the home are, like number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, this or that. If they, if they have in their head that you told them you were going to find something with everything that they want, and then you can't find it, you're kind of disappointing them. So you really have to get them to prioritize. So you might have a list of, you know, 20 things that there's there, you know, when you say, tell me some things that are important to you, and you've got multiple people there and they're rattling off number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms and acreage and, and the pool and close to a park and trails and um, not near my mother-in-law, something, you know, you need to know which ones we're gonna mark as priority. It could be the garage. So if a garage is a major priority, don't show them things without a garage. But if you found something that hit most of them, would you want to write an offer today? Would, if we found you something with four out of these 20 things, would that move you to wanting to put an offer in today? So if you have agency, they're pre-approved and they're ready to write an offer, you take them shopping. Okay. So we spend a lot of time here on this, uh, this wish list where we're talking about those 20 things or sometimes people are, are, easier and, and don't have a, a lot that they want. They might just want the town. But we need to find out what the wish list is. Um, you know, who'll be living there? Did we make sure that we got all of that information? Because, you know, some people, like I work with some buyers that never bring kids to, the, to any of the appointments or the showings. But I need to know how many of them there are or why they, if, if there's enough room for them. <laughs> are anyone's parents gonna be moving in with them? You know, who's going to be living in the home? The adults, the children, pets? Do they have pets and they need something with a fence? If you have to name your top five non-negotiables, what would they be? And definitely make sure you know those. So sometimes people are going to put things that they really want to have, might be one of their top five. And when we're setting them up with receiving automatic properties from the, from the MLS, it might not be a field that you can put in there. So you have to let them know. When I set up your, you know, I call it a listing cart and I explain to them what a listing cart is. When I send you those properties, there's gonna be some that fall outside of these parameters. You can just discard those ones out of, out of your listing cart. So, but set the expectation that some of the properties that you're gonna send them might not have everything or they might have more some things that you don't want that's okay you know do they have a preference for when for what year the house was built if it's an older home there there could require a lot more maintenance um so is your is your person handy are they able to do those types of things do they need something turnkey do they need something new do they want something new do they want something old so we really spend a lot of time here. Um, do you want the house that's move in ready, turnkey? Some people will ask, when people visit your home, what do you want it to say about you? You know, do, you, do, do they entertain a lot? They might need something with, you know, an open concept because they entertain a lot. Maybe they have all of the family functions at their house. 
Are there any specific features that would make your next house feel instantly like home? That's a great question. And what do they need any special accessibility? Is there somebody that might have some type of physical handicap that needs first floor living? Does there have to be a bathroom on the first floor? It's important to know those things if that's something that's important to them. Okay, so we're setting expectations here too, right? We spend a lot of time here because we wanna be on purpose about going shopping with them. So I set the expectation that, you know, when I'm working with buyers like yourselves, we usually go see anywhere from one to six homes before we make an offer. Or we, you know, really what I'm saying is we usually go to look at one to about one to six homes or two to four homes when we find the right one to put an make an offer in to find the right home for you. What I'm really saying is I don't want to take you to 25 homes before we find the right one. So let's spend a lot of time here with, with our buyers so that we can show them the right homes. We don't want to show them homes that they can't afford because we don't want to let them down either. We don't, what will happen if you do that is they're going to have that picture in their head. So if their buying power is 400,000 and they call you up and they say, Susan, I want to see 123 Main Street and 123 Main Street is listed for 550,000. I say, no, we don't just go see that because they're curious, because as soon as they see that the $400,000 homes are not going, they're not going to want them. So we have to nicely walk them down their path. Well, tell me more about that. Let's look at, you know, let's look at your pre-approval. Do you have other resources that I'm not aware of for a $550,000 purchase price? Maybe they do. If you haven't known them very long, they may have more resources that you're not aware of yet. Sometimes they hold on to that financial information until they're super comfortable with you. Yeah, I was talking to my parents and, you know, I'm not seeing anything in the $400,000 range. So they're going to actually help me out with some cash at closing. Great. Now I know that. Let me make that appointment. Tell me more about that. And Jason says, yes, all data should be in command your notes, your emails, anniversary dates, birthdays, you can build campaigns around anything. So when we talk about that 33, that 33 touch or 36 touch, however many contacts you want to have with them throughout the year, if you have their birth dates, that's an easy one. How many, who doesn't want to be recognized on their birthday? I haven't met anyone yet. You don't have to say their age, but people like a happy birthday text. They like a happy birthday card in the mail. So put all your notes in there. Put the names of the kids, the names of the parents, if the parents are moving. Put the names of their pets. Um, the more personal you are with them, the, the more rapport you're going to have. This is business for us, but this is personal for them. Uh, you know, this is, I call this the Jesse Davies question. There's an agent up here named Jesse Davies. And he came to an open house that I was hosting with a buyer. And when they came in, they bypassed the kitchen and they went right to the master bedroom. And, the, you know, his buy, when their buyer left, his buyer left, he just stayed back and chatted with me. And I, I said, why did you bring them, like, you bypassed this beautiful kitchen? And you went right to the master bedroom. He said, well, he always asks his people, you know, what is the most important room in a house for you? Because people's um, attention span, they make a decision when they walk into a house so quickly that you want to show them the most important room to them. Because if it's something that's going to check, that's their number one box, you want them to fall in love with that first. Because if they don't love the living room, they won't care then because they've already fallen in love with the master bedroom because that's the most important room to them. Or is it the kitchen? So go to that room first. And that's okay. You don't have to start in the kitchen. Um, but know your, know your, know your, um, your buyer, what their wish list is. 
one way that you can come up with questions and finding out what their wish list is too is to go to your MLS. When the listing agent puts something in the MLS, they're filling out prefit, you know, specific fields so that you can pull up the MLS and you know right to where to go for bedrooms, bathrooms, things like that. Those are the wish list questions really to find out what's important to them. The acreage, the square footage, the number of rooms, number of bathrooms, the handicap part, the yard. And it's always important that we don't judge a house by what we want because all buyers are different. So we need to listen more and talk less sometimes. I put, you know, sometimes you're going to walk into a house and in your head, you might be going, I would never live here ever. They love it. If it's all their boxes, then that's perfect. It's not about what we want. It's about what they want. Okay. And you can ask your buyers after each showing, I'm going to ask you to rate the home. If you come back to me on things, you know what's so powerful about that, rating your home? I'm we're going to let you know up front. We're going to go to these showings. We have three homes to, sh to see today. After each showing, I'm going to ask you to rate the, ho the home on a scale of 1 to 10. And if you, have, if you come back and things are a 9 or 10, those are the ones we should be writing offers on. Okay, Because some people will, as Jason had said earlier, they're like, mm, I really, I love this. It checks every box, but let's go see some more. Why? And it's okay if it's the first one you see. So some people are very, get very nervous when it actually comes time to write an offer. So we're setting expectations here. If I, if we find everything here and I, or we're checking most of these boxes and I'm asking you to rate the home and it's a nine or a 10, we should be writing an offer, right? And you're saying, you're, sh you're nodding your head saying, if it's a nine or 10, we should be writing an offer. And you're giving them clues and you're planting seeds in their head that yes, okay, when it's a nine or a 10, it's an, it's an offer. Does anyone have any questions? Has anyone been doing this or how do you guys feel about this wish list? page. I, I got a question. Uh, can you scare a little your buyer if they still don't, you know, after uh, they, they saw uh, five houses, they still don't put the offer on it, on uh, any of them, they still want to see more and more and more. So can you say like, uh, listen, in today's month, you like this house, right? From nine to 10, it's, it, it's eight. from one to 10, it's eight. So you should you should uh, write uh, you know an offer because in today's market tomorrow there'll be a ten offers on it so you don't want to miss it something like that you know scare them a little listen you, you better put an offer on it right now because tomorrow it'll be gone you want you want to say something like that or rather not no you know it's very that comes back to that whole we need to be having direct conversations and at, and giving direct information and asking direct questions, sometimes a buyer will have to lose out on a house in order to take you seriously with that. And, and I know it when I'm doing it, like, I'm like, they're going to lose out on this house. It's perfect for them. They're, they're gun shy. They don't want to put the offer in and they're going to have to lose this house in order to see that what I'm saying is true. The next one, they most likely will, will not do that. Right. Um, but it is, it's important to set those expectations on no. So know your market. What are the average days on market for that town, that neighborhood, that price range? How many homes are even available with that criteria? And then what are the days on market before they go under contract? And you can get those. If you need help with how to finding, how to find that information out, go back to your market center, your, um, your, your, your technology director or your coach or put it out on, you know, on your market center, Facebook page. How do I get this information? It's on your MLS. 
and it's powerful information to be able to tell your buyer. Right now, I'm asking, you know, if it's not already written in, in some type of communication between agents about that particular listing on if there's a deadline for offers, I'm asking the agents that. So if I'm showing somebody a house, so for example, I'm taking a buyer tomorrow to an open house. It fits, it's everything that they have, we have talked about them needing. I have their pre-approval already done. I already have all of their docs done. I've already called the agent to find out if there's gonna be um, a deadline for offers. I've communicated this information back to my buyer. I said, for this property, for you to be a strong buyer, for you to have the most chance at getting that house, this, these are some things that we need to do today before we even go see it. So you're, set, you're setting those expectations and kind of doing that homework up front. And sometimes it's price point, right? Like the, like the offer price. In this market, if the days on market for that, for that type of house are like two, putting in a low ball offer and you've already run comps on it, putting in a low offer is not going to get them that house. Some buyers have to lose a house because they don't want to, they want to bargain. They're, they're maybe old school. Like there's some old school buyers out there that I'm never starting at asking price. Yeah. You're never going to get the house then today, <laughs> you know, so you have to sometimes make them, make them feel some pain. And then it's like the, the pain versus pleasure conversation where you have them, they have the pain. You got to lead them over to some pleasure for the next one. Does that help answer your question? Sure, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Sometimes, um, if I can just sort of add to that, Absolutely. I had always thought that the, um, uh, I'm, I'm not even on the darn screen here. Um, I had always thought that, um, you know, the deadline was, was, a, was um, you know, oh gosh, thank God we've got one without a deadline. Um, but then I was driving home from the showing and I got a note that they accepted an offer already. So, um, they, you know, just making sure they understand the market they're in is so important. It is so, so super important. And just because there, there is a deadline, that doesn't mean that they're not going to take a great offer that comes in. The seller can do whatever they want to do. They might say it's Friday. We're, we're showing it all weekend and we're reviewing offers on Tuesday. If that seller gets a phenomenal offer over the weekend, they can take it. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't be the lazy agent. If, th if this fits all of their criteria, you have an agency agreement signed. They're pre-approved. They can write an offer. Don't wait till Sunday to go see it. Go see it Friday or Saturday. Get mm -hmm. your offer in because they can choose to take whatever they want. Maybe you, maybe there's something, and ask the listing agent, right? On behalf of your buyer, you have a duty to act, call that listing agent saying, outside of price, what's the most important thing to your seller? They really would like to get under contract as quickly as possible, but they don't wanna close until the end of January. Great, I have somebody that can wait that long. So if you write an offer that weekend, it could get accepted if you put that in there. Find out what it is, that's important to your buyer, F help them find that. And then you need to make them as strong of an offer as possible to win. Great point. Thanks for bringing that up, Michael. All right. This is a good stopping point for a break. You guys ready for a little break? <laughs> it's 1035. Is 10 minutes good for everybody? We'll come back at quarter of 11. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to come back a little bit early too. So if anyone has any other questions about some of the things that we've gone over, we can, we can do that too. Okay.
Does anyone have any questions on the what we've gone over so far today? Feel free to ask them now if you do. Susan, if you don't mind, I just want to tell you something that I have attended every one, since, every one of these sessions since day one. I know you've been in a previous session that I have attended. And with the culmination of everything that today, this has been one of the, um, the most advantageous and informative sessions that I have had. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're getting some value today. Thank you. Good. Awesome. I'll write that down. Leadership will know about that. <laughs> oh, good. They'll double my pay for doing this. Zero times zero. <laughs> Let me do the math. We'll go three uh, times. Oh, you're so, I'm, I feel so important now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I do appreciate that. I really love teaching these classes. Um, and I encourage all of you guys to, you know, if you want to learn more about anything, then start teaching a class on something and participate. It really does help me or whoever's doing that to learn more and become more, more knowledgeable in that area. So kind of fires me up too to go work with some buyers this weekend. So we're going to talk about um, neighborhood insights and neighborhood insights. They, it, it's good because it demonstrates expertise because we wanna be showing our buyers that we are the expert, that we're the professionals, that they can trust us. Because there's so many agents out there. There's, uh, you know, they, a lot of the people that we work with have a lot of choices. They might know a lot of other agents, but we need them to pick us. So we can use the neighborhood staffs to do the heavy lifting on showing um, how, how our, what our knowledge is. And you can do that through Kelly or through Command. And what we're doing here is, you know, we're learning some, some buyers are very, might be very particular about what neighborhood that they want to live in or what town. So you can pick neighborhoods that are meeting some of their criteria or most of their criteria. And you can do an insight on that. So we're, what we're doing is we're looking at in that neighborhood, what is the average listing price? What's the average selling price? what's the average price per square foot? So I always find that one, the price per square foot. Um, some people are very in tuned with, well, I don't wanna pay more per square foot for something. I find more higher end homes, more pricey homes, they really calculate the price per square foot. Um, and in some areas of the country do, you know, comps on price per square foot more than other areas. Jay, do you, have you ever really used the price per square foot a lot? No, I, I don't, I, I personally would probably just take that one right out of there, but. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's heavily driven off of the TV shows that we watch. And as you, you we got to remember that they're in major cities. So as they build up, price per square foot comes into play because you, as you go up in a, a high rise, it becomes more money. We don't, I mean, we're in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We're in, well, pretty much all New Hampshire and Southern Maine. We don't have high rises. The biggest they can build around us is maybe four stories. Um, so price per square foot's tough because if you're in a new construction neighborhood, which is where they also want to use it a lot, like upgrades and materials. Like if they're building one house that's basically builder grade, then the neighbor comes in and is going to do a, a ton of upgrades. Their price per square foot goes up. So price per square foot's tough unless you the condos. I would say condos it works. Uh, anything high rise works. Um, you know, it's the same problem with price per acre we have up here in 
up in, uh, up in farm country. Um, you know, <laughs> it all depends on what's developable and what's not. So yep. it's not really a great. Not a measure. huge one. But, you know, right now, total active listings, total pending listings, those are those can be important. School ratings could be important. Um, and, you know, is there a neighborhood website? So you can gather this information and be the expert to your buyers, what you're doing, even if it's not something that an area that they're going to go in, you're showing knowledge. And this is good practice, too, to start learning your market. Um, if they're, you know, if they are very in tuned with saying they want to live in, you know, this particular neighborhood and nothing's becoming available, find a lookalike neighborhood and do some competitive marketing, market analysis and uh, find out if there's some way to kind of adjust and move your person from one wanting one neighborhood into particularly it want maybe going to a different neighborhood that has a lot of the same characteristics um, and find those similarities set yourself apart and show value. That's what doing this type of thing is going to provide to that buyer. You know, I, I was talking to an, an, a new agent and I said, you know, well, what are you doing for lead generation? Or, or he was looking at getting another job. And, you know, he wanted to be like a, a valet at a very expensive exclusive club. And I said, great, tell me more about that. Why do you wanna do that? He goes, well, I'm gonna bump into a lot of pe people that have a lot of money that might need to, you know, need a realtor. I said, well, great. How are you going to let them know you're a realtor? He said, well, I'm just gonna say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm also a real estate agent. I said, great, then what are you gonna say? He goes, oh, then I'm just gonna give him my card. Well, great, but then what are you gonna do? And there's no plan after that. People won't really do a lot of business with you unless you're showing them and giving them value. And I think that a lot of people get their license and think they're just going to be able to hand out their card and tell people that they're an agent and the business is going to just start flowing in. And it doesn't work that way. We need to be the expert. We need to show our professionalism. We need to add value. And we do that by giving knowledge by demonstrating our knowledge of the market. So we have to know our market. That's why we do things like preview properties so that we can let our buyers know what the market is looking like right now. And you can use, um, you know, you can have Kelly do a snap for you. You have your tech trainers teach you how to do that and do that in command. Um, you, can, you can also demonstrate this by running comps through your MLS for different neighborhoods. When you can tell them and rattle off, when they say, how's the market? We shouldn't be saying, yeah, it's hot. <laughs> we, we should be giving them actual information. You know, like, you know, it's very busy. It's very competitive. We're seeing average days on market in Dover being this, or we're seeing price points increase by this much, or you know, give them specific data. It might not even be pertinent to what they're looking at right now, but you're planting seeds in their heads of how professional you are and that you know your business. And then when they're meeting with somebody, you know, when you're showing that consistently to them, and Andy, this, this will happen for you. When you're consistently showing those contacts that are not showing any intent right now, but you're showing them and you're offering specific expert knowledge of the market when they do have someone in their life that's ready to interact, to have in, that showing them intent, they'll think of you. When they're at work and you're, their coworker is saying, you know what, I'm thinking of buying in the area. We've been coming up here a lot. And now that my kids can learn by Zoom, we're thinking of, of buying a, a home in the area they're gonna think of you because you've shown them and demonstrated knowledge. So that's why we keep contacting them. That's why when we go back to that funnel and we had at the very top, the, the contact part where we're having two-way communication, that's why that two-way communication is so important. And what we say matters because when we drop it down and to cultivate and we're looking for people with intent, we have had to have given them reason to want to show, for them to want to show us their intent. Okay. 
home buying, how buying a home works. Oh, I love this part of the buyer presentation. Um, this is where we get to explain the process. It should be informative and it should cultivate confidence. This is where our buyers, we're gonna show, we're gonna show them how we shine. They do not know what the buying process looks like. They might th think they know what the bu buying process looks like and they could be completely off the mark. So we need to make sure that we're all on the same on the same page as to what the process looks like. And it's different in different markets. So, you know, it starts with number one, partnering with an agent and absorbing, um, absorb their local insight, get to know the neighborhood inventory levels. We need to be able to show them that, okay? See what's, uh, see what's about to hit the market, gain access to off-market properties, review market averages, complete needs assessment. So we're actually just putting it right out there to them that, you know, your first step, congratulations. We're sitting down today. That's your first step in the buying process. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to going over this with you because this is the first step, okay? And the second step is let's talk about your financing. What are your thoughts around your financing? Have you spoken to anybody? And if they start saying, you know, this is where a lot of people will have said, yeah, you know what, I've already gone to, um, you know, Rocket Mortgage or Bank of America. Sorry if anyone's spouses work at Bank of America. They, they're good at a lot of things, but home loans is not one of them. Um, you know, getting pre-approved for a loan is definitely, I, know, I, I say things inappropriately sometimes, but hey, it is what it is. And you need to have direct conversations about this with your folks. So there goes that raise. Here. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> have partner with some local lenders guys um when john my husband first got his license he partnered with a local lender and i tell you what she taught him so much about this business she's and we still work with her after all these years she just taught him so much right from the beginning um, about the buying process. And this piece of it, when we can nail the lending piece for our buyers, we are really showing value. So we want to talk to them about a local lender. And this is where I usually will say, tell me about your, um, you know, have you talked to a lender? If they say something that's like a, you know, a big box national brand. Then I start talking to them about, you know, one of the ways to be a strong buyer in this market is to be working with a local lender. And let me tell you why. And then you tell them why. And there's lots of reasons for that, right? You know, first off, we need great customer service service on the lending side because one of the areas that is very stressful for a seller is the buyer's financing. They need to know and have confidence in the lender for, for whoever they're going under contract with. And Jamie, I always urge buyers to use local financing and offer at least three, three lenders. Yeah, local local really resonates on the seller side, and also you know, the financing piece when you go when this when you go under contract and and this is what I tell them the financing piece when you go under contract is one of the most stressful parts for the seller, but in working with a local lender, you'll alleviate a lot of that stress for the seller, and most agents will recognize the local lender, and I can sell that on your behalf. I can give them information to sell back to their sellers on the benefit of you using this local lender. Because, you know, we all know the same people. You're going to run into the same agents and out there. And as you start working with more buyers and more sellers, you're going to run in, you're going to hear the same local lending lenders names. And boy, when I'm working with a seller and I know that lender, huge sigh of relief for me. Um, we need to work with the local lender because we really need to have a strategy around what their monthly payment's going to look like. And I need to have clear conversations with the lender on that. We need to understand your debt ratio. We need to prepare for escrow, going under contract. We need to get pre-approval letters. So working with a local lender, you know, a lot of times we're writing offers at night and on the weekends. 
the rocket mortgage person out in Colorado is not going to be available for me on a Friday night or a Saturday or Sunday. And I might need that information on, on off hours. I need to be able to get in touch with that lender. So getting pre-approved for a loan can be a lengthy conversation with a buyer. And the more direct that you can get on that is, is better. And then we can kind of open that up and offer some additional advice while still staying in our lane because we are agents, we're not lenders. But this is where we're going to remind them that, you know, we want to we want to work with the local lender so that we ha understand where some pitfalls could be. Like, you know, we don't buy new cars during the buying process. That happens. Whew. And if, so, if your buyer's numbers are tight, we need to have conversations with them around working with a local lender and then getting taking their advice. So they might give you advice that sounds like don't open up any new credit cards, don't pay off any credit cards, don't put any large deposits into your checking account because that has to get sourced. Do not buy a new car. I don't know why it's always the car, but it's always the car. People buy new cars while they're buying homes and it can blow up their ratios. And, and I've had it actually blow up a deal when I, I had the seller and the buyer right before closing bought a car and their financing got all screwed up and they couldn't purchase the house. So we're having these conversations about lending and financing. So that's part of the whole, how, how buying a home works. And then we let them know after we do those two things, congratulations, you parted with me, a great agent in the market. I'm gonna do a good job for you. We have your a local lender here. We've got your financing set. Now we can go shopping and we can find you a new home. And I'm aligning that we are doing this together because I want that agency agreement signed, right? I want to already be planting seeds in their head that we're here today and we're going to be working together and we're gonna sign documents to do that. Um, we're going to compare homes and neighborhood averages and then narrow down the neighborhoods you wanna live in. Sometimes it depends on where you live. There are some areas in the country where Neighborhoods are specific. It's not really as much like that for me up here, um, but it could be towns. It could be areas of a town. I do have one lady that only wants to live on a one street in Durham. And she had, would have to sell her home, but she can't put her house on the market because she literally will only look at homes on one street. She's like an F buyer. Not, she's not even close to A, B, or C. But it's important to know that up front. Um, we're favorite homes and save them to collections. So that for us would look like um, that listing cart. I call it a listing cart. And they can do that if you set them up on a search in, in your MLS. There's usually a way for them to tag favorites so that you guys can look at those. If there isn't a way in your MLS to do that, then find a way to set them up on a search and then talk to them about what their favorites are. I look at my clients' searches all the time because when I set them up on the MLS, I wanna be able to go through and A, see if they're looking at anything. And B, if they're tagging things as favorites, I need to be looking at those and be proactive and call them and say, hey, I see that you liked, you know, 123 Main Street. Want to go look at it. Maybe you're doing that, you know, looking at homes together with them and finding favorites. It could be that you're looking at them online before you're going out to see them. That's a great thing to do in this market, especially if it's, you know, if it's getting cold or people might be COVID sensitive. Let's get online and look at these properties and the pictures and the photographs together. Do drive-bys, coach them on how to find their new home. Please go do a drive-by. Save yourself some time by having them go do drive-bys before you set up showings because there could be like a landfill next door that's not shown in the picture and not noticed anywhere. And no one did a Google Earth picture to see that. If they do a drive-by and that puts them as an out, then you just saved yourself and the seller and the listing agent a whole bunch of time. Schedule home tours and plan on plan an itinerary. So you're going to let them know that we're going to we're going to search for properties online. We're going to look through the pictures. You're going to do drive-bys, and for the ones that that make sense, we're going to go look at them. We're going to match them up against you know you said you really want to be in this school district. 
we're going to bring them back to that that wish list when they're when they're looking at their homes so that you're going to explain what that that whole shopping piece looks like to them and that's where I usually, that kind of lightens the mood a lot too, because they're going to get excited about going shopping. And that's what I call it. I said, are you, gonna, are you ready? You know, we've done all of this work. Are you, get, are you ready to go shopping? Let's go shopping for a house. This is going to be so much fun. And then let them know after, oops, oh boy, what did I just do? Hold on. Let me go back. Here we go. Um, after we find the right home, we're going to make an offer. And this is, again, when we go, we're going to go, we need to be putting that seed in their head that when we find the right homes that meet most of your criteria, those eight, nines, and tens, we're going to put offers in on them. Get them in thinking that we're putting offers in. We don't want to go shopping forever. We want to be able to write offers. And I do like to tell folks, you know, when we find the right property, and if it's the first one we look at, that's okay. When we find the right property, we need to move quickly without rushing. When we find the right property, we need to move quickly without rushing. We need to put the offer in. So when that happens, we're going to review contract terms and time limit for the offer. We, and you can talk to them about, you know, what does it look like to put an offer in? Well, what it's gonna look like is you will have to put an earnest money deposit down and that money gets taken out of your checking account as soon as you go under contract. Not everybody realizes that, okay? And you can start talking about how much are we looking at here for deposits. Some people might be thinking it's $1,000 for a $400,000 home. Not in this market, it's not. So we have to make sure that they're gonna be prepared to write a $5,000 deposit, a $10,000 deposit. What, what is that gonna look like? In this market to be a strong buyer, the seller might be looking for you to put a $10,000 deposit down. Are you gonna be able to do that? It will get taken out of your checking account right away. Okay. It will go back to you at closing. Some buyers will think that the, the seller just automatically gets that deposit. So you have to explain what that, what that looks like. It's a deposit, it's held by one of the brokerages. It gets put back towards your costs at closing. We're gonna negotiate purchase price. We're gonna work with your lender on a title company. You're gonna to have to look into homeowner's insurance right away. We're gonna talk about closing dates when we write offers and some of that's gonna be dependent on the seller. You know, and, and you're going to have, there's going to be paperwork to sign. So talk about the electronic signing process and what that might look like. We do want to also, you know, they might have a timeline that might not work for all sellers. It, do they have a home to, to sell before they can buy? Let's, you know, that might be that we have to talk about and build a strategy around. Okay. But this how buying a home works is really a fantastic rapport building part of your buyer presentation. And it's very educational. And a lot of people really need this. They might not realize all of the components. They might not realize all the money on the, on the making and going under contract part. Like, you know, there are certain out-of-pocket costs that happen at time of service, like your inspections. Depending on the property, you could be looking at no inspections, which we're seeing more of now than we ever did, which I'm not a fan of, but we are in the market that we're in. You might be having um, a lot of inspections. You might be doing a water, a radon, a pest, a general building, a septic. You know, if they're doing all of those inspections, they need to be prepared that that's going to be a couple thousand dollars. It could be a couple thousand dollars at time of service that you don't get back. So you better be making an offer on a property that has the, has, is showing all the signs of getting to the closing table. Um, Linda is asking, how do you navigate submitting multiple offers? If one is accepted, what happens to the others? Is there any kind of liability if two offers have been accepted? Oh boy, is that a can of worms, Linda? We. <laughs> And such a hard, that, thank you for asking that question. 
we really should not be putting offers in on more than one property for one buyer. And we never used to do that. Are we seeing that now? We are unfortunately seeing that happen. Why are we seeing it? Because three properties might go on the market all in the same weekend. And if you put an offer in on one and you don't get it, you might not have an opportunity to put a, an offer on, on the other two. But you still, you're still not supposed to put an offer in on more than one property because you could get two offers signed. Because right now we're putting our best offer in like it used to be that you'd put an offer in with the expectation that there'd be negotiating, negotiations happening. Now we're putting our highest and best up really almost, you know, for me, if it's, unless it's a, it's a rarity that a house has been on the, on the market for a very long time, I'm, I'm encouraging my buyers to put their highest and best offer in just for the chance of trying to get that accepted. But if you put your highest and best offer in on two properties at the same time, they could both come back signed. So if that scenario does happen, you've got to have to backtrack and tell one of one of those listing agents that your buyer has moved on with a different property. Jason, from a leadership standpoint, what is uh, leadership's opinion on that? I mean, I don't want to come out and say that you should be writing offers on more than one property for one buyer, but are, we are seeing that happen more now than we used to. Well, if they're doing it, we don't, we, they're not telling us because if you get two offers signed, your buyer's on the hook for two properties. And then, then it comes down to, we represent our clients until we have to represent a contract, right? And once, once your brokerage gets involved and it comes out that they can't buy the other house, they're not, you know, there's many probably states in here. So different, we're going to talk Maine and New Hampshire. That's where I'm licensed as a broker. And um, both states require that if you can't get a denial letter, you're buying both and you can't get a denial saying because you're under agreement of another property. So you have deposits now on the hook, which can be really painful. So um, if, if agents in my brokerage are doing it, it's, you really shouldn't yeah. do it. No, it's bad. It's, and it's also, it's an ethical thing too. You know, our buyers, our buyers may sometimes want us to do things and our sellers that we just can't do. Well, and yeah, we have yeah. to be able to say no to them. We, you know, we have a no deal and no commission is worth compromising your ethics and, or getting a call from your broker. And I, and I tell people all the time, right? So like when I teach the classes, I teach the contract classes here in new construction at, at my market center. And I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter if it's one of you guys in this room, that's a brand new agent or me, that's been an agent for 20 years. When you stand in front of a judge and you say, blah, 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 the judge is going to say, you, you know, better because you hold the license, right? So it doesn't matter if it's you or me, we hold licenses that state we should know this ignorance to the law is not okay. So that's where, that's where the, the brokerage is going to lose in the court over that deposit. And your broker is going to say pretty much, congratulations, you're writing the check. So, you know, in some of these deposits, I mean, I've seen thousand dollar deposits and I've seen $300,000 deposits. I don't want to be on the hook for one of them, any of them. You know what I mean? If you guys got an extra thousand bucks, my name is Jason Westcott. You can mail it to you. <laughs> so just be careful of that. Like I said, yeah. we're the licensee. The courts and the commissions are not on our sides. They are there for public protection. It's yeah. us to know the law and not to get them in a, in a situation. Yep. Go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, isn't that, um, we basically covered that in, in our courses before we even got our licenses. They can sue for specific performance and then you're, you are, that could be the last transaction you ever make. Right. Yep. yep. It'll be the last one at the brokerage, I'll tell you that. Right. <laughs> isn't that... <laughs> Isn't that a situation that even like above and beyond the buyer being responsible and losing a deposit to the second seller that they didn't go with, can't that second seller then turn around and sue the agent? And then it goes to that whole recovery fund and then you're done. You know, you it's suing an agent's really tough. I'll be honest with you. Like, so can it happen? Yes. What, 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 what typically happens is and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of lawsuits, but typically what happens is if there's a problem, the attorneys sue the seller's attorney of the property you didn't buy. will sue both brokerages because we have E and O insurance. Our E and O insurance will then turn around and say it's it's neglect on on contract law, so they won't cover us. 
So now it's going to be between the brokerage because let's and let's be honest, the contracts are technically with me and right. Susan Kenyon's buyer or seller. It's not Susan Kenyon, but Susan's involved as a secondary. So we get sued. And then once you get out of that, the agent won't get sued civilly, but the sellers and buyers will. And all the seller needs to sell, the buyer needs to say is, I was told by my agent to do this. Even if you said don't, they will say that. Everybody wants to look good and be right. right. Especially when there's, we got to remember, you know, I know our attorney 650 bucks an hour. I don't know what you guys' attorneys cost, but ka-ching, 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 it adds up. So, you know, that, a, a $5,000 problem becomes a $30,000 problem really quick. So yeah. just- it, it, it's ethically and illegal to do two offers at once. Cause you could be, unless you disclose it, you know, you, if you, if you put in your offer, disclose it. And I would recommend that anybody that wants to do this, talk to your managing broker of your office. We have verbiage where we can do it. Um, where the, the seller of the other party needs to understand that we have two offers in the other one is X street. If we don't get that one, we would like to continue with this one just to see if they're in the position. You, we never win when we do them, but to just blindly start writing offers, you will lose in court. I don't yeah. How about what is. this, this Michael Mahoney's suggestion about the deadline on the chat? Is that Maybe something right. that he said, put an offer deadline in for something like four hours, then offer on the other. You, yep, so you can, you do, can that. do that. Okay. Yep. yep. We, we, we suggest prior to the market, the craziness that we're into always put a deadline on a contract. We suggest it all the time. And okay. What happens is agents are doing it. Agents are saying that I want to have my open house this Saturday. We're going to review offers on Monday. Agents are now going in and saying, we want our offer accepted by an answer by Sunday. We're out. And the other agent saying, no, did you present that? Now we start breaking into brokerage, fighting over whether offers were permitted or were presented or not. That mm -hmm. gets to be a little ugly. But yes, he is correct. Susan Kenyon, this offer is good till 1.30. And then I'm going to go buy Jason Westcott's listing. All right. You so know, that's an you, you out if you have a buyer that's insisting. Right. But, what, what, but what you need to understand when you do stuff like that, uh, we're going to, we're getting off topic, but when you do stuff like that, that is a hard line you drew in the sand right there. So, what, so the seller may say, I, I don't want that. I'm out. And at one that deal is dead. Now, whether your buyer says it or your seller says it, the seller say, may say I'm over. Your buyer may say, no, I want to go to two thirty. The law states that that's a dead contract. So you, now you have to rewrite a new one. Okay. Right. You got to remember that when right. you go to court, they don't want to hear your stories. They, right. look at, they go like this. That's not what it says. You know what I mean? Right. Because I've been there a few times. I, I yeah. And if, you're, <laughs> if your buyer is insisting, you don't have to do what they insist. I mean, no. you want to do whatever you can to educate them on what is allowable and what is not. Yeah. And if they're saying, I don't care, I want to do this, then don't work with them. Oh, right. Nobody yeah. is worth, nobody, no client is worth your license your, or your reputation. Because I'll tell you yeah. what, the, you have to think about that. It's a small community. Yeah. Well, your, your, your contract in all 50 states, this is national, is lawful obedience. And the easiest way to explain that is, hey, Susan Kenyon, I'm Jay Westcott. I'd like you to represent me. Great. And I only want to live in Portuguese neighborhoods because I'm Portuguese. She can't do that. She just broke one of the major 11s, right? right. I don't want to live next to Portuguese people because I am one. She can't do that either. So lawful obedience. We can't break the law because our client wants us to. Right. Hey, Susan, I want to buy this house cash and it's all drug money. Nope. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> or no. You know what I mean? So lawful obedience is that's in all states. But yeah. Believe me, we, we I've ran, if I, oh. if we had, if you guys want to have fun one night, we can talk some stories. <laughs> I've seen some easy stuff in my career, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you, lawful obedience. So if anyone's yeah. asking you to break the law in any, no matter what it is, ethic oh, right. law. can't. Legal law, like you, you, you can't, right? Yeah, can't do it. And and you know that's why training is important because we need to always be super clear on what we are and are not allowed to do. So thanks for bringing that one up. Um, but how how buying a home works is a great way to build rapport with your buyer. It's a great way to educate them. It's a really great way for you guys to shine and show your professionalism and add value because we're, you know, information cultivates confidence. And that's the, the name of the game here. And this can be a, a good part of your buyer presentation. If you're going to skip anything, don't let it be this one. I don't really love the graphic here, but you can definitely work on that and make it look a little bit better. Um, Affiliated business arrangement disclosures. This is for Keller Mortgage. Um, I, full disclosure, have not used Keller Mortgage. There are other folks that have, um, but we do have, when you're talking about pre-approvals and, um, and lending, 
you can recommend Keller Mortgage. I know that there are agents out there that have very successfully used Keller Mortgage. If you want more information on that, I would go onto your um, Market Center's Facebook page and ask who's used Keller Mortgage that you can talk to. Okay. Real value, real experience. So this is about all about your value proposition. You, you need to distinguish yourself as the expert. And sometimes that is by letting them know what they can and can't do. So some buyers may think that they can write offers on multiple properties and educating them on why they can't also shows that you're the expert. And most of the time they're going to be okay with that. They need to be uh, aware. They're not all, also not always thinking about what is the seller's perspective and how being a strong buyer, we need to think about being a strong buyer means you're thinking about the seller. I love win-win transactions. And then I explain to them why I like win-win transactions, because I represent you. You are my priority. When we create a win-win transaction with the seller, it gives you a stronger likelihood of getting your offer accepted in this market. When we're under contract, it makes it a, a more pleasant transaction because there are going to be times when the seller is going to ask things of you. And then there's going to be times that you're going to need to ask things of the seller. And we don't always know what that is until we're moving through the process. It could be things like extensions on deadlines. And if you're being contentious right out of the gate, then the likelihood of the other party wanting to work with you kind of deteriorates. Um, so we do want to distinguish, distinguish ourselves as experts in the market. So having a page in your presentation about you and your business is great. Now, this is a challenge, right? Because you guys are mostly new agents. How, how do you do that? You have, if you're on a team, you have team numbers. You're in a market center, you have market center numbers. You might have um, pieces in a previous work history that lend itself to being very valuable in real estate. You may be a veteran. If you're a veteran, I would put that information on here. Absolutely. You might have um, experience with nonprofits or being on boards of directors or being involved in your towns or cities, municipalities. Those are fantastic things. What is it about you that you bring to the table in your real value, your real experience. You know, I love this, the down at the bottom right, the win-win the or no deal. Integrity, do the right thing. Customers always come first. Commitment in all things. Communication, seek first to understand. Ask questions. Creativity, ideas before results, teamwork, together everyone achieves more, trust, start with honesty, success, results through people. This is, you know, I really love this. <laughs> Hi, Jason. That's, so anybody that wants to use that, that's the old one. The new one oh, has an E at the, the bottom. Old. Yeah, it has an E at the bottom for equity. For, for equity. Equity. Yeah. But, you know, this shows you who you are. This is like a value. This, this shows your values that these things are important to you. People want to know that you have integrity. Okay. If it could be, you know, this person here is putting their education on here. You could do that. That might be important to you. It might be important to, you know, if you have a marketing degree or a sales degree or whatever. Um, find those things and it's going to look different for all of us. Okay. It's more important for you to demonstrate these things than it is for you to just read them off. So like demonstrating them is explain, you know, giving them stories about who you are, explaining your background, demonstrate integrity and, and doing the right thing by always doing the right thing. But this is a great page to put into your buyer presentation. And go to your market center if you need to kind of piggyback on the market center's numbers. So we're going to move on to conducting the buyer consultation. Now you've got your presentation done. Now you need to go give the presentation, right? So practice on it with your family and friends. Do not practice it on your first buyer consultation. 
you know, pick a family member, you know, your friends and family want to help you. And they can give you very valuable feedback on things that they liked or didn't like. And ask them for that feedback. So when you give it, you know, ask people that will give you honest feedback too. Like, you know, we, we have a tendency to, if you're giving it to a people pleaser, that is only, if it's your, if it's your mom and your mom is only going to tell you how fantastic it is, pick somebody else. Okay. Pick someone that will actually give you some solid feedback and can some constructive criticism and let them know that that's your goal. I'm looking for some, this is my new presentation. I've spent a lot of time on it. I'm really looking for some feedback. Okay. Um, so the buyer presentation, <clears throat> I'm going to pass on that one. Buyer presentation agreement, closing the buyer consultation. We want to get that signed. When I'm doing a buyer presentation, I do start off with that. I do start off with their, they called it the dream home. I started with that rapport building conversation where I'm asking about and learning about what they want, what they need, how I'm going to be able to serve them. And then when it comes to, you know, you, you get to that point during the presentation where you're talking and they're doing this, that means you stop your presentation and pull out the paperwork. If you have somebody that is giving you the, this nodding of the head and they're giving you the sign that they're ready to go, you don't have to complete your presentation just because you brought it. Get the contract signed. Um, if they're not ready to sign, that means that they have a question that you haven't answered yet. So if you've gone through the whole presentation and they're not ready to sign, put your pen down and say, Jason, I feel like there's a question I haven't answered for you. And find out what that question is and answer it. The buyer agency, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of the agency agreements because of the different states, but I always like to mention here, we need to talk about how we get paid. So once we, say they are signing the contract, that is going to be part of it too. Is it that, you know, you're only getting paid from the listing side? What if it's a for sale by owner? What if the listing side's not offering very much and you might need to get some of that money from the buyer? Those are things that you need to start thinking about because those days are have been coming where the buyers are paying for some of the compensation to the agent and they're going to come here more. It's going to happen more and more. Um, <clears throat> so I won't go down that ra rabbit hole, but it is important to be clear on, com on um, commission and how we get paid. I find that when you're, you know, we're going to have to be very direct when it comes down to contracts and negotiating. So you need to be demonstrating to your buyer that you can have those hard conversations because you're going to need to have them on their behalf. When I get to this part of the presentation, where we're talking about the buyer agency agreement. I call it, I don't call it a buyer agency agreement to them. I, when I pull that paperwork out and cause they're giving me the, the nod that they're ready to go. I say, great. I, I think that I can, you know, I can help you. I would like to work with you. I'm, you know, you, you also want to say that, that you're picking them. So I call this a loyalty agreement. They're nodding their head, they're ready to sign. And I say something like, great, it looks like we're ready to get started and get some paperwork done so that we can go shopping. And then they nod, you say, great. What I have here is some, um, some paperwork. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is this buyer agency. And what this really is, is it's a loyalty agreement. And what that means is we're choosing to work together with each other exclusively. And why I like the word loyalty agreement is because somewhere in here, you need to explain to them, they can only sign this with one agent. Just like we talked about buyers, do they put an offer in on more than one property? Some buyers think that they can sign a buyer agency agreement with more than one buyer's agent. So we need to let them know that this is a loyalty agreement where we're agreeing to work exclusively with each other. I'm really looking forward to that. Have you guys read your buyer agency agreements? Okay, read them. 
we really, uh, and thanks for being uh, transparent on that. You should be able to break that agency agreement down line by line, upside down. Okay, so when I pull out my paperwork, I keep it very neat and very organized. They don't wanna see your papers garage sailed all over the desk. Okay, you take out one paper at a time and be very organized. You take it over and you flip it over so that they are reading it. And then you can point to them line by line. And I love, I go, th unless I have like a really um, high D personality, someone that is just wants the high points, I don't go into detail. I'm, I'm very cautious of reading that about people. I, then I do go through it line by line and I just point to it. Line one says this, line two talks about this. Line three talks about my commission, how I get paid. Because it's important for them to understand that this is not a hobby for you. This is how you feed your family. So I do get specific here. And if there's a chance that I might be charging them some commission, then you take your time here. If you see a property that you really like that is um, being sold by the owner, you please let me know that because I can call that uh, I can call that seller on your behalf. There may be a situation where they can pay my commission, but if they are not paying my commission, then my commission to you would be 3% at the closing table. So be, be clear on that. Um, if you stumble over any of it, they'll lose confidence in you. So that's why you practice reading it, the, reading the buyer agency agreement and knowing what each of the lines mean because it's not that they're gonna read every word in every paragraph and make sure that you did it correctly. They, they need to know that you have confidence in that. This is a contract. It's a bilateral contract, okay? There's a beginning date and an end date on it. So they sign, now you need to tell them, don't call listing agents directly. So by signing this loyalty agreement, let's talk about that. What does it mean when, as we move into this loyalty agreement? Excuse me. <coughs> Ooh, sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze there. Um, so then you want to talk to them about that. And I let them know. So what this means, this loyalty agreement means, it means that if you see a property uh, with a yard sign in front of it, don't call the number on the yard sign. Call me directly. If you see something, you know, people, even if you're setting them up on a listing cart, they're doing this all the time, buyers all the time. They're on Zillow, they're on realtor.com. They're looking while they're in the grocery store line. And that's okay, so I let them know. You might see something online at, on, on Zillow and I ask them, what, where, do you, where have you been seeing properties prior to today? Great, if you see anything on there, please call me directly. If you hit the get more information now button, you're gonna get inundated with calls from agents. If you do get a call from an agent, please let them know that you're working with me. I also let them know about open houses. Like I'm going to encourage them to go to open houses. I will typically reach out to my buyers on Friday. My buyers that I know are hot and are going to open houses, I call them on Friday. Are you going to any open houses? If you do, just let the listing agent there know that, um, that you're working with me. Okay, we wanna be reminding them. Um, Give them, you can also give them some of your cards. If you go to an open house and they need your information, feel free to just give them one of my cards. They can reach out to me directly. Okay. And then remind them when you do go to open houses and I am not there with you, please have a poker face. Don't give away any leverage to the listing agent while you're there. Feel free to ask questions about the property, but don't let them know that this is the most perfect home and you'd pay over market over listing price for it you know they they don't always think of those things um, and I do always like to remind them at this point go to the open houses and you don't know when something's being recorded okay this everything in a house can be a, a listening device these days your phone your Alexa your Google Home um, I've had I've had my own sellers leave their laptops open and video what's happening during showings these things happen all the time. So we just need to prepare our buyers for that, especially if you know if they're going with small children, let them know there could be cameras on. I don't know. Just be cautious about what you do and what you say. 
while you're in the house. And then call me and let me know if you see anything that you really like. Okay. Um, I'm in Rhode Island and we don't have buyer agency. Oh, that's interesting. You don't have a, any kind of buyer agency agreement in Rhode Island? Huh, that's interesting. We're not um, there yet. I thought, sorry about that. I couldn't figure out where my mute was, but yes, that's my understanding. I'm a, I'm a, again, newer agent. And so that's my understanding. So it's a little, yeah, daunting. I we in a did. Sense. Do, do we? I thought we did. Cause I would Mitch, go are back you, to Mitch, your are you still on? I don't think so. Is there anybody else on from Rhode Island? Yes. I, I, Mitch, you're still on, right? Didn't we learn in class that we had buyer agreements? That's uh, something that it looks like Jason's looking up right now. I, I'm, and I mean, you can to, Google it. To, I was going to go to the, that. I mean, I just Googled one and then I, I, I would be shocked if you didn't. Um, yeah. Because when you're writing offers, you are representing people. Um, so I would check in. I don't know if Jason's Googling or checking into that with somebody while we're on the line on the on this class but um if we what, don't have an answer before the end of this session please go to your leadership today and ask them because you should have some type of buyer agency agreement yeah okay i think, I think we're being told to get one because a lot of people are going a lot of a lot of people going in without a buyer agency agreement and then they're being shot in the foot basically so I, right. I i think i think it's i think it's here i just um I, for clarification i think jason's gonna mention yeah. that okay yeah, yes. i'll sit tight so it's <laughs> and the rhode island in our marketing agency as well in our the rhode, the rhode island buyer agency agreement so for you guys in rhode island it's your rsa 520-6-8 is buyer agency agreements um and then you guys also have dual disclose so the other question if you don't know about buyer agency, if you if you guys are truly new and never seen these forms, you also want to find out from your brokers um, how you guys practice, whether it's traditional or designated. So that's a whole nother can of worms that, that could come into play. But yeah, you guys definitely have a buyer agency agreement. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And before you fill them out, go to your leadership and make sure that you're filling them out correctly. Um, and it's and if you if your leadership is not holding any types of contract class, then I would try to met, get um, a seasoned agent to mentor you on that and ask to participate in, you know, even if it's quietly, like as a, a silent bystander, ask to be able to shadow some buyer presentations and ask to have a, a seasoned agent review an agency agreement with you. I know I have done that for newer new people up here that have needed some help with that. Um, most agents, the, one of the great things about Keller Williams is that we help each other. And I know we're all from different market centers, but that is who Keller Williams is. And I, I know that there are agents on in your market centers that will help you with that if you don't know, if you're not having a regular contracts class. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the buyer representation agreement, you know, don't rush through these things. You are asking someone to sign a contract. So you're explaining each line as you're going through it. They need to understand, you know, what they're signing. Um, they need to know that they can call you when they're out in the market so that you can get them the most accurate information. Um, and they need to, for you to know that you're the, they need to know that you're the expert, the expert here and that you're going to guide them through this process. So the more confident that you are look, going through these forms with them, that's how they're going to feel when you're going through the buy, the purchase process with them. So it's, it is kind of a big deal. Okay. Um, buyer, uh, role model, the buyer the buyer presentation agreement. I'm not going to do that because we are in different states and we have different state rules. Um, Sue Doyle, not reviewing a completed contract with someone outside of your broker if you are a designated office though. So you would be asking for someone, if you ask for help with a buyer agency agreement, it has to be a generic, like a, not one that you actually have with a signed person because not everybody, you shouldn't be showing your files to other agents. If you're a designated agent, they, they can't see those. 
I think that's what Sue is trying to um, make sure I mention here. Um, because we have, uh, you know, we represent that buyer. I could be going up against that other agent with their buyer, and now they have seen confidential information that could put my buyer in a less competitive situation. We do have a responsibility with our um, our our clients to keep confidential information confident. But I don't want to role model the the buyer agency agreement because we all have a different one. So what I will role model just a little bit is I do like using the word loyalty. I do let them know that this is a contract that they're signing. It is a bilateral thing. We're both signing it. So it's important that, I, you know, when I'm meeting with somebody in person, I don't um, have any of my signatures pre-signed. I like them to see me signing it. There's something that happens inside someone's head when they're physically signing and when they see me physically signing. Um, so keep that in mind too. And then of course, make sure that you keep all of your documentation in, um, you know, confidential and you can then start building your opportunity in command. So once I have a buyer agency agreement and all of the additional paperwork that goes with it signed, I create an opportunity in command because my intent is to get that person under contract and sitting at a closing table with me. So I do that, you know, like I said, we talk to ourselves more than anyone. If that's signed, I'm planning on selling them something and getting them to the finish line. So I put my paperwork in command in an opportunity as if it's going to be happening very quickly. Um, you can share your KW app. So that's definitely an option. This is, and if you're going to be doing that, the buyer presentation is a great time to do that. When you share your app, your branding will be shared along with the app. So you do all of that through Kelly and through command. And I would say, go to your tech trainer. There's probably a class on how to do this. And if I know Robert Vincent, our tech trainer and Jason had put his YouTube page up earlier in the chat. He probably has a video already on how to do that. I am not a technology genius, just, so I'm not just, going to tell you how to do that. Just so you guys know, if you if you have Kelly, K-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, or if you don't have it, <laughs> I would say put it in your phone. The brand new one was supposed to be released Friday and it wasn't ready. So we're going to get it any, we're going to get it in Q5. That's what we're telling people. Uh, September <laughs> never. So it, it's about to get launched out. But if you put the, if you put Kelly in your phone now, when the new one comes out, it's going to be a click of a button. It's going to con, you know download it and convert it. So the new one is going to be much better than Kelly. And I personally thought Kelly was pretty good. But yeah. put Kelly in your phone and get ready because the new one's coming out. They're now saying next Friday, but if I had a dollar for every time that happened, right? <laughs> well, it, it, it will be coming and it's going to be great. Um, so that is a great piece to use too. So if, you're, if your buyer is somebody that is going to be utilizing that, you know, know your audience. You might have some buyers that will never use something like that, but um, it's a great value add to be able to do that. Um, there is a KW app in App Store. That is not, we can share that too. Thank you for sharing that. That's true. Yep. Awesome. So you can also go to um, collections and saved homes. So utilize, you know, there's a lot of functionality in um, command. And if you have your folk, your contacts set up correctly and they're viewing properties and you can see that stuff in command or on your app, those are great ways to reach out with value. So we're trying to, you know, even outside of having an agency agreement signed, if you are, if you have someone saving homes because um, you're trying to add value and you see them starting to save and look at properties, that's your time. That's when they, you know, that whole funnel where we got to the cultivate part where they're showing intent. That's showing intent. If you are sending them a listing card and they're starting to look at properties, that's intent. That's when you then you you heat up the frequency with which you're contacting those folks. This is a lot of work being a real estate agent, isn't it? 
align your guide. So customize your guide in command. There's just a lot of resources for you guys to go to once you're in command. Um, so you can have a buyer's guide and you can customize that so that when your folks are getting it, it's, um, it's customized to however you choose to set that up. Um, and of course, command designs for your presentation and your guide or create your own, but have something. Um, don't wing it. The buyer presentation is a business meeting, so we should be prepared for it. This is personal for them, but it is business for us. So preparation is super important. The more prepared you are, the more confident you're going to be when you're giving the presentation and the more well-received you're going to be from your buyer. They're gonna be more inclined, you're gonna get more of the nodding of the head to sign the agreement when you are prepared. Okay. And, you know, we're at that section of our presentation here on ahas, you know, how, do, does anyone here have an aha on today's topic or things that might resonate with you that um, that was shared today? Feel free to just unmute if, if, if you have something. I really liked the loyalty um, piece, the, the way you explain the buyer agreement um, and, and the depth that you took on it um, because I think sometimes we get so comfortable with the person we're talking to, especially by that point in the presentation where we really, we, we you know, th there's a, there's a tendency to leave your guard down and you really want to, you know, it's, it's not so much a matter of keeping your guard down is, 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 is you, you really want to make sure that they understand that, all of the things they need to do to protect themselves um, as your um, buyer. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you like that. And, you know, customize that piece and make it your own. When you can use language, you know what I like about things like that is that you're using language that they already understand. They understand the word loyal. They don't understand buyer agency. That means very little to them. Right. <laughs> right? And it also starts making it more fun and interactive because it opens up the ability to have the conversation with them on what their responsibilities to you are. Let's get them on board. This is, a, this is not me doing all of the work for the buyer. We are a team here and we need to be going at this objective of getting them the perfect home as a team. Awesome. Does anybody else have an aha uh -huh from today? guiding them how to attend open houses and uh, what information to give or how to be careful and uh, also not to click the get get more info while they are browsing <laughs> thank you for sharing that you do you need to let them know to stop clicking get more information you know we know that that's all that is is a lead capture for Zillow to sell that to somebody else. They have no idea that that's what they're doing. So I tell them, stop clicking the button. Don't click those buttons. If you are feeling yourself compelled to click that button, just call or text me and I will, I will help you. And the important part about that is that when they do call or text you, you've got to respond quickly to them when they have those questions. Ask better questions and, you know, or give, give those types of pieces of advice. Let them know how you want them to behave. Thanks so much, Anita. Okay. Um, you know, this is really kind of the basics. And I think that when we go back to the basics and even for me, when I choose in my mind to go back to basics, my business grows. So this is part of the, the basics, doing the buyer presentation, doing it well. Um, oh, Michael, I am, your, I am your own personal get more information button. I love that. That would be a great marketing piece, Michael. You could definitely do a fun marketing piece around that. I might hijack that, actually. <laughs> um, 
but master this to get referrals. This business is really so great for getting referral business. When you master this and these conversations, this is how you'll start to see your database numbers grow. This is how you'll start to get referrals so that you get you know, new people in the funnel into cultivate where someone's gonna show intent and then move to appointments and get activity. Because, you know, people love to talk about if they're shopping for a home or they're selling their home, they're going to go out to dinner and they want to talk about it to their family and friends. So when you're really knocking this out of the park, if they're talking to their friends about going about buying a new home, somebody at the dinner table is going to say, well, who are you using as an agent? And how's that going? You want that to be like, they're doing great. I'm working with Anita and she's just fantastic because it's also like birds of a feather, right? So if I'm buying a home, some, one of my friends might be buying a home. It's like when you go to buy a, a new car, you start to see that car everywhere. When buyers are out there in the marketplace, they start seeing other friends and family members and coworkers that are, that are um, out there in the marketplace. Cool. Daily success habits. So, you know, this, the math doesn't lie. The number is 10. You, you have 10 contacts added a day, 10 conversations a day, 10 handwritten notes a day. If you're, if it's five o'clock and you're at eight, keep going. If it's one o'clock and you're at 10, keep going. How would your business look if you doubled down on this? You're going to get to a, a, somebody that has intent and a need faster. The more contacts you have, the more conversations you have. Handwritten notes are so well received. I do a ton of them. Handwritten notes, you know, if you have a conversation with someone, drop a handwritten note in the mail as well. If you are choosing to go on social media, which you should be doing, that is a great way to figure out handwritten notes. Use the people in your in your sphere, in your in your Facebook feed. Find out what's happening in their life. Did someone just have a baby? Send them a card. Did someone just get engaged? Send them a card. Did someone just lose a loved one or a furry friend? Send them a sympathy card. Let them know you care. That's a, a I use if you know when I do Facebook for lead generation. I'm on purpose about it because I'm looking to get information about people so that I can show them and demonstrate to them that I care. And I also am trying to remind people in a non-pushy way that I'm in real estate. So I'm using social media here to remind them that I'm in real estate without being the agent that only puts just listed, four bedroom, two bathroom home, just listed, just sold, just under contract. Don't be that agent either. Be a person. But mix your mix it up so that they're you're showing people through social media that, you know, that you are an agent. And preview homes per 10 homes per week. You can do this digitally too, guys. You know, if you're having a hard time getting out in the market right now to see homes, preview homes by going to open houses preview homes by broker tours. I'm starting to see broker open houses again. Go to those if, the, if you know of any. You can um, also offer or and, and ask other agents in your marketplace, is someone going to be having a home inspection? Home inspections are an awesome way to learn about homes and about the maintenance of them so that when you are taking a buyer out, you know what, the, what you're looking at. They're looking at, you know, the granite countertops, you should be looking at, you know, is there any signs of moisture coming through the ceiling? Ev, you know, turning the water on, looking underneath to see if there are any signs that the sink's leaking. Um, you know, all of those other maintenance possible issues that could be happening. Termites in, in the basement. What? Termites in the basement. Termites in the basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you can see those things and pick up on those things when you're shopping with a buyer, you can be writing offers on more appropriate properties for them. If you're seeing maintenance nightmares and your person is not handy, 
you need to have those conversations with them. So, cool. So don't forget these, you know, that is what you, what we are wanting you guys to do the, you know, 10 contacts, 10 conversations, 10 handwritten notes daily, and then 10 homes previewed per week. I have okay. a question. Sure, Anita. Uh, when we bought the house, we did a home inspection last year, but the home inspector and the contact for the home inspector came from my agent. And the home inspector didn't uh, miss out on the leaks, the asbestos. There was a beam which collapsed on the roof. So everything the home inspector missed. So, uh, but, um, so my husband was upset with my agent, but I really like my agent. So I just made her escape. But, uh, but actually my question is, and the home inspector didn't take the responsibility because we already start, started the contract work. So my question is, will the agent be responsible because uh, she didn't do anything, but uh, she referred. That's what my, uh, my real estate uh, uh, class coach was saying. Uh, they both will be responsible, but we didn't so, pursue it. Yes and no. When something goes wrong, we're always, we always get blamed. It's yeah. always our fault. You okay. know, it, it, whether it's our fault or it's not our fault, people always think that it's our fault. I'm, you know, we do need to be super clear when we're in the marketplace with our buyers that we are licensed real estate agents. We are not inspectors. We are not attorneys. We are not um, accountants. I would question who she's re resourcing for inspectors. Um, I don't know why she picked somebody that wasn't doing a good job or if they were having a bad day. No, he is actually a very good, he's in service. He gave us wealth of information and he, he is actually very good, but he just missed out on uh, so many in our house. That yeah. I, I, you know, in that scenario, I would empathize with my client if that happened to one of my clients and I would go back, have them go back to the inspector. Sometimes it's not going to work out that they get that the, you know, like you in this scenario, get an actual someone to take responsibility for it and compensate you or anything like that. It is sometimes something that's going to happen. Um, some people will, when they're referring for an inspector or a lender or some other resource, will pass over two or three names and let that let the person pick. That's an op. So from an agent perspective, on how do I avoid that happening to me? Yeah. That would be something that you could do to not have that type of exposure. She gave a few names. I picked this one. Yeah, that's your fault, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> not an agent's fault, no. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she if she gave out a licensed inspector who has experience yeah. in the business, you know, sometimes the wrong thing happens and we just have to be able to get them through that too. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so this part here with your your scripts, you know, please try to find a way to 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 practice them. It really is important that we're not practicing on our customers and our clients. It's important that we practice with each other so that we're giving them the best. They deserve the best of our experience. So give them a good experience. Success leaves clues. Successful agents have and continue to practice scripts. So because remember, Ignite was developed by asking successful agents what they do, and that's what they, they script, they practice. It builds confidence. It will help you close more deals. It will help get you there faster. When you can speak in terms that the customer understands and in language that they understand, when, you have, when you're very confident in your abilities and that you give yourself the ability to listen to what they're saying, you'll react better by because you'll have practiced your scripts and we'll have internalized them. You'll know how to communicate and handle those objections. So we do have to always mention the do not call list. If you guys are going to be cold calling and I, you know, people have built their business on doing this, calling expireds, calling, um, you know, for sale by owners. 
if somebody is on the do not call list, you cannot call them. If for some reason you do call someone and they say, why are you calling me? I'm on the do not call list. Your script is, I'm so sorry. Let me take you off my list. I'm wishing you the best day possible and get off the phone. Okay. There are fines. I always get the number wrong, but I think it's 41 or $42,000. It's steep. It's definitely starts with the four, four something. Um, that you could have exposure to a, to that type of fine by calling people on the do not call list. There is information on the Ignite Facebook page on the um, how, to, how to make sure that you're not calling people on the do not call list. So I would um, send you in that direction if you need help in guidance on how to find that. Okay? If you still are having struggles, then um, go to your market center leadership and um, your tech trainer and ask for some help. Okay. There's plenty of people out there to help. We don't need to be calling people that don't want to talk to us. Um, update contacts and follow up. Um, you know, this is where you're utilizing command. If you're, if you, if that's what you're choosing, most of you should be choosing that. You don't have to pay anything extra for that. It's covered. Use it. It's really important to keep updated contact information. It's important to keep notes in there so that the next time you communicate with them, you remember what your last conversation was about. And it will help you, you know, use the smart plans in there so that you remember to contact them frequently. Okay. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we're bothering someone, but we're not. We're really coming from a place of contribution. We are here to help people and we're here to, to offer value. Okay. Contract practice, please, please read your contracts, know them, practice them, read them, fill them, fill blank ones out, you know, uh, go to an open, if you go to an open house, because you want to preview a home, go back to your desk and pretend you were, you're, you were with a buyer and write an offer on it, so that you can practice how to write an offer. Go right from the beginning and practice writing a buyer agency agreement with yourself so that you can practice filling it out, okay? I'm a big list person. Make your success list. What are the things that you have to do today? Um, prioritize them. Do the most difficult ones first. Uh, do your lead generation first. 42000 for that fine. And that brings us to, wow, that's pretty close, 1201. That brings us to the end of today's Ignite session. We did it. Thanks for sticking with me today, you guys. I really appreciate that and am grateful that you chose to you know, spend this much time learning about buyer agency and buyer consultations. I know you guys can do this, so go knock it out of the park. But remember, it starts with a contact and an appointment. So I'll be back at contract to close, and I'm going to want to hear you guys tell me that you got some appointments set. Okay. If you have any questions or need anything, I am going to put my name and info one more time in the chat. You're always welcome to reach out to me. And if anyone has a question, I'll stick around and help. Thank you, Susan. You're very welcome. It was nice seeing you again, Anita. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you hopping on and helping me out. No problem. I was just here to, you know, have my cool TV on. That's it. <laughs> See you guys. And I just realized I put my...